Welcome to the first lecture of Machine Learning 1. Um, my name is Eric Beckes, I'll be your teacher for this course and I'll be recording a lot of videos like these. And this is basically the first one. Um, so, well, let's get started with it. I thought it made sense to start off with explaining what we actually mean with the term machine learning. I mean, nowadays it seems that almost any algorithm that uses data of some sort is called a machine learning algorithm. Uh, for example, this often includes concepts we are used to to refer to simply as statistics. Um, so, well, let's, let's just start off by making precise what we mean with machine learning and we'll see that it is indeed a quite general term which we can break down into several subcategories. Now, this is a widely used definition of machine learning put forward by Tom Mitchell, who is a renowned researcher in the field. He wrote a book about it. Um, basically, this is what he had to say about it. Uh, a computer program is said to learn from experience E with respect to some class of tasks T and performance measure P if its performance at tasks in T as measured by P improves with experience E. Okay, so this is a beautiful sentence, but it's very hard to parse. So let's just break it down into these three core components. First of all, a computer program is designed to perform some task T. Right, so we want to automate some pro pro process, and we call it this. Oh, sorry, we call this the task T. Right. Now, in this context of machine learning, such a task always comes equipped, or such an algorithm always comes equipped with a performance measure P, and this performance measure P is a way of quantifying how well uh, the algorithm is doing its job. Okay, and basically want to optimize this performance measure. Then, how are we going to do this? We're going to do this with experience E. So this is, let's say, the most important notion of machine learning is the, the, the concept of experience E, which is used to improve my algorithm. And this improvement is measured by this performance measure P. Now this first example, it's uh, in the context of image analysis or uh, really converting handwritten digits, images of handwritten digits to the actual digits. Right, so the task is uh, looking at these images, they're already sorted here, but so if you look at the top row, these are all zeros, and we want to recognize that as being a zero. These are, these are ones, these are twos, uh, and so on. Right, so now experience comes in the form of labeled images. Uh, the experience is that someone uh, showed me an image like this one and said, this is a zero. Um, someone else wrote down this thing and said, this is a tree. Okay, so based on this experience, I'm going to improve an algorithm uh, that, that automates this task of digit classification. So this is a famous data set called the MNIST data set. You will encounter it throughout this course. So it consists of handwritten digits of size 28 by 28. Okay? Um, yeah, okay, so let, let's move to the, to the next uh, uh, topic. Now, now we're considering a different task, a different setting, and we're, we're considering actually the, the analysis of tumors. Um, why is this relevant? Um, well, uh, there are many types of tumors. Some are benign, some are malignant, so they are very harmful, and we want to treat them as soon as possible. And sometimes it's not really easy to see from the outside or from some some medical image scan, whether, what, what type of tumor it is. And we can actually, that is actually a way to determine, determine the type of tumor uh, more accurately. And that's by uh, looking at the expression of, of certain genes. So what we're looking at here is an expression matrix of genes. Um, or on the horizontal axis, we have the tumor types. Uh, so each column represents one tumor. So uh, for example, this one represents a, a breast tumor. Uh, this one represents uh, leukemia. Now on the uh, vertical axis, so each row represents a particular gene. And what this plot uh, really shows, it, it's a heat map. Or we can look, consider it as a heat map for activity of a gene. So when the color is green, uh, we basically say this gene is very active. Uh, if it's red, it's not particularly active. Um, what is actually measured is uh, messenger RNA. So this is a product, uh, a protein in all biological signal processing pipeline. 
and the genes basically describe a way of how to produce these uh, mRNAs. Um, but the point is, we are able to measure the activity of genes. And so now we can invent several tasks related to this data. And one of the maybe most obvious tasks is to automatically classify such a profile as belonging to one of the tumor classes. And what we see here, all this data, we can think of it as experience, right? So uh, let's take, for, for example, look at this particular profile. Uh, whenever we see a profile like this, uh, we might be tempted to say, oh, this is uh, a melanoma we're looking at. Why? Because, for example, you see a lot of green, so a lot of activity of this particular gene. So it encodes for small nuclei, I guess. Um, but experience tells us that whenever we see a pattern like this, uh, it's probably a melanoma. Right? So this kind of experience we're going to use uh, in maybe some other examples later on to automate uh, the process of labeling uh, samples into several tumor classes, as in this case. Now, this is a type of experience that maybe you can all relate to. It has to deal with uh, the classification of, uh, well, identification of spam in your mailbox. Um, so basically, again, experience in the form of data. And in this case, the data are, uh, well, sentences, it's text. So basically our experiences, for example, that we, um, well, whenever we see these sort of discount trigger phases, we're tempted to say, oh, this is spam. I don't care about it. Uh, <laughs> I'm not going to read it. And there's all these cues that from experience, we learned that, okay, uh, these are indicators of spam. So that's how we can look at the experience. And we can use this experience uh, to design or to improve automated algorithms. Okay, so that was focusing mostly on the experience part. Uh, now let's have a closer look at the, the task. Uh, so, right, a, a machine learning algorithm has to perform a particular task. And typically it, it relates to automating some process that we as humans are used to doing um, to, to a computerized format. For example, the task would be classification and classification means we have an input and we want to place it in some, some class. So if let, let's do it manually. I see a two over here. I see an eight over here. It says a zero. This is an eight or a nine. I don't know. Um, this could be an eight, could also be a nine. I'm not fully sure. But the point is we want to assign each image to one of the, the, the particular classes. And later on, actually, we'll, we will adopt a more probabilistic viewpoint. Um, Meaning that sometimes we're not fully sure, like uh, in these cases, if we're looking at an 8 or a 9. And then we want to assign probabilities, like uh, with some probability this is an 8 and with some other probability this is a 9. And then maybe later on we can still make decisions based on these probabilities, but we have a notion of uncertainty. Okay, that, that's a task. Uh, so also for the spam identification, this is also a classification task. We want to classify the, the, the sentences as either spam or non-spam. So let's do it manually again. That's spam for sure. Okay, so um, machine learning is all uh, about automating these kind of processes. Um, well, not, not, not necessarily only about automatic processes, also to, for exploring data, but we'll see that later on. Okay, so we just covered one class of tests, namely classification, where the task was given this input, put it into one out of, let's say, n discrete classes. Uh, a different class of tests is that of regression. In this particular case, uh, we're looking at inputs, for example, this input x, and we want to map it to some corresponding value here on this vertical axis. So we want to find a function that maps this in input x to some, some value. And this value is no longer discrete. It can be any, it, it is a continuous thing. So anywhere on this vertical axis, we can, can place this target value. Um, so that's the main thing about regression task if that, that is that we're not mapping to just a discrete value, but to a continuous scale of values. And um, so when we talk about regression, we typically think of uh, function fitting. And in, in this case, um, so we'll use this ex example a lot during this talk. 
So we see this green line, let's think of it as a true signal. So uh, this green line is actually a sign to pi of x. So that's our ground truth sort of. Uh, but in reality we always have to measure things or uh, we have to deal with measurement errors, uh, measurement noise. So the things that we actually measure, like so these blue points, is actually this true signal with some epsilon noise, some random variable. And typically we, we model this with uh, a normal distribution, for example, with zero mean and unit variance. Um, yeah, so okay, the task is given an input x, map it to some continuous uh, output through some function f of x, and the goal is to find this function f of x. Now, again, if I would want to do this manually, then what I would probably do is define some class of functions, let's say polynomials. Polynomials, they have to form like f of x is some constant, w0, plus a weight 1 times x, plus a weight 2 times x squared, and so on, uh, up to some weight m times x to the power m. Uh, so I have some, some choices to make here. One, first of all, the order of, of the, the polynomial, and then I have to find um, well, the optimal weights that make sure that this function comes close to my target value. Right, so I've measured these blue points. I've measured these blue points, and now I want to find a function that best fits through these uh, blue points. And green is the ground true reference that we actually want to recover, but we don't know it. Now, if I just pick a zero or order polynomial, then I'm really dealing with a straight line. So I can only tune this offset parameter and then this horizontal line is the best I can do. If I uh, go to a higher order, well, MS1, it's, I'm just adding this slope to it. So I'm looking at these two coefficients. So, so I'm tweaking these W values and I found that this is really the best I can do. Uh, so this is, of course, a very tedious task to do manually, and we we'll want to automate this. Now, uh, when you go to higher order, maybe at some point, M is 3. I actually am able to do a pretty decent job. Uh, so this red curve seems to flow nicely through the data. So I'm quite satisfied with this. But of course, we can move it a bit to the extreme. So let's go to an order, M is 9. And then I get this extreme fit. Uh, but what you can see, it exactly moves to the data points. So these blue measured points, my red curve fits perfectly. So I was able to tune my W's such that I have a perfect fit basically on this data. Though it looks a bit wiggly and I'm not super satisfied with this, but given my data, I would say this is a, a pretty good fit. Okay, so we had the class of uh, classification. We have a class of task called regression. And then we also have clustering. Now clustering is also uh, a task of itself. And the idea is mostly to explore the data, to find structure in the data. Um, if we think about tumor classification, um, maybe we know that there, are, that there are different types of tumors. I'm not fully sure how many types, but one, some part of this subset of tumors are very harmful and some are not. And we want to sort of look which tumors are more closely related than others. And uh, you can do this by clustering methods. So uh, let's take a look at this data. So horizontal on this plot were all different tumor types. And if you now just select one of them, basically this activation pattern, we can represent it as an uh, n-dimensional vector. For the purpose of illustrating this, uh, we just assume that we have a way of reducing this n-dimensional vector to uh, a 2D point. Basically, this 2D vector, a uh, vector of length 2, that's sort of a summarizing uh, vector of this n-dimensional vector. Uh, we, later, we will see ways of actually learning how to do this mapping. But now we just assume that we have a way of representing each tumor with just uh, two values. OK, so then we can fill in this plot on the right. So we have a lot of tumors measured. We all compute these 2D uh, summarizing coefficients, and we plot them. So one point is one tumor. Now the, now the task is to explore if there are uh, patterns or if there are tumors that are related to each other. 
and we can do this via clustering. And let's just quick, quickly go over a, a way of doing this. Like we could do this by assigning each tumor. Let's say there are four classes. So we want to divide uh, all these tumors into four categories. So what we could initially do, we just randomly assign. So let's write it down. So randomly assign each xi to one of four classes. And that's what you do, what, you, what, you, what we show here. So each color represents one class, and then we have this nice colorful point cloud. Uh, what we can do next is just look at the mean uh, to the value, to the vector value of each class, uh, because that's sort of summarizing well, what a tumor within this class looks like. So if we compute the mean over all the, the yellow points, it's probably located somewhere over here. It's close to the origin because it's so spread out. Um, if we look at the mean of the blue points, it's over here. Red, uh, green over here, red over here. So these crosses, which maybe you don't see too well, this, this is what they call the cluster means, mu i. Okay, what I can then do next, so basically these mu i's are a descriptor of my class of tumors. It's, uh, well, the, the average uh, vector value within that class. So what I can do is just look at, now again, I reiterate, so I look at all my points and I want to assign them to, well, the closest mu i. So the, the cluster to which it looks most similar to. And what you then get is this partition over here because the centers were here here, here, and here. Um, okay, so now we have a new partition and we can, uh, of course, uh, reiterate. Uh, so look for closest cluster, or actually maybe most similar cluster. Um, yeah, and then we so we compute the mean of each cluster. So we have a new mean over here, here and here. We iterate, and then we get this partition. And uh, so basically, what this tells us, uh, we find a way of partitioning all my data into four classes. And uh, basically, we, we are now able to say if a, if a new point comes in, for example, this one, it's closest to the yellow class. So uh, we know which kind of tumors are similar. Okay, and we can use this later on in our analysis if we have to make decisions about treatment, for example, then we, then we can look for a treatments that were successful on patterns that were in the same cluster, then maybe it makes sense to use the same treatment for, um, well, this type of tumor that we just measured. Okay, uh, then we come to performance measures. So, of course, we have a task, uh, we have experience to improve this task, but we have we need a way of measuring if my if we are actually improving on performing this uh, this test. That's that's done via performance measures. For classification, uh, a relatively straightforward thing that you could think of is simply count the amount of times that you were actually correct in um, making your prediction. Um, yeah, so let's write it down. Uh, we can write it down mathematically as follows. So uh, we just take the average over this indicator function, which looks at in which cases my uh, label, or actually my prediction, which is this why I had, coincides with my label. And this indicator function, we will encounter it more often in the course. It's defined, so let's write it down. This is called an indicator function. And it's defined as being one if y i is y i hat and it's zero ah, sorry basically it is zero otherwise okay so you can directly see that if all my predictions are correct then this sum or this average averages to one if everything is wrong then the, the accuracy is zero and if i'm right 50 percent of the time the accuracy value is 0.5 Okay, so we have a way of quantifying how well I'm doing my job at classification. Also for regression, we can think of 
uh, ways of measuring its performance. What is typically used is the mean squared error. Uh, error. You may have encountered that in your studies already. So mean squared error. So again, let's write this down. Uh, we have labeled data. So for every x i, I have a target y i. And I have a prediction that I made. I made this prediction y i hat. I look at the difference, I square it, and I take the, the average over all my uh, samples. So that's the mean squared error. And again, this, this yi, it's sort of this function that we are fitting, which was parameterized by, parameterized by a set of weights w takes as input this xi. So we had labeled uh, data, right? For XI, every xi, we had a yi. Okay, so of course, this is what we want to optimize. And this is what we were doing actually in this example before when I was doing this manually. So if we look at the differences of uh, the red line, which is our fit, and the data points, or the blue points, you will see a lot of differences. So we would say this has a large mean squared error. Um, let's go to the third example. These differences are actually not too, too bad. So I would say uh, this is a small mean squared error. And in this particular case, uh, really the, the curve or fit goes straight through these data points. So we would say that this, this right model is actually doing a perfect job because it has a mean squared error of, of zero. Now also when we talk about clustering, we have to come up with a performance measure, a way of saying how, how well we are doing our job. And so we have to think about what our objective is. And with this clustering, really what we're looking for is to find clusters of points that are very similar to each other. And we can quantify this similarity within a cluster by looking at uh, uh, the distance of each point to a cluster center, right? So each cluster had uh, some, some average uh, value and we want to minimize the distance within each other, uh, within the cluster to each of these, these centers. So that's to have a sort of compact group of points. So we can quantify that by looking indeed at the distance of each cluster center towards each point in its cluster. And basically this min operator here is sort of selecting uh, the appropriate cluster, right? So if we take a point of this point, look at the distance to each center, then the blue center is the closest one. And that's the distance what I, that I want to consider. All right, so in the example before, we were actually sort of optimizing this performance measure. Now, a main thing is, is so a main thing in this whole machine learning process is reporting these performance measures. Uh, but the tricky part is um, it could give you a biased view of how well the algorithm is doing. Uh, so if you look at the performance measures on these four models that, that I went through, like a, the first one did a very bad job. The third one was actually doing a great job. And the fourth one, yeah, I mean, given this performance measure, me uh, measure, it was doing an excellent job. But if I look at it, I would say it's actually not so good. Uh, so let's see what's happening here. So if we take a look at the best performance on the training set. So the training sets were these blue dots then it's for sure this, this rightmost model was doing a perfect job on the training set. But if we look at it like, okay, which model is performing best on new data, then it's probably this one, right? So if I take some new point, uh, some X value, and it's probably mapped close to this green, the, the true data with some noise. So let's, so maybe it's somewhere over here, then yeah, I. I have this small distance, so it's actually quite okay. But if I look at the same point in, in this, this right model, then yeah, the, the corresponding point on my model is maybe somewhere over here, so it's, a, it's doing a terrible job and I make a large error. So if I would um, report the performance measure on this new set of points, which I haven't seen before, then the rightmost model does a very poor job, whereas the, the third model actually does a good job. So that brings us to the question on, on which data points should performance be measured? Um, well, it should always be done on a test set, at least if you want to have an impression of how 
how well it is at generalizing to new data points, you should always test it on an independent test. Set. So let me write it down. Performance should be measured on new data, so which we typically call test data. Right? So really, really uh, remember that whenever you report numbers, uh, you should do this on a test set which you haven't seen before, otherwise you will get a biased impression and you would have the impression that you're doing actually a great job, but then when you really move your uh, machine learning algorithm to the field, to, to some application, it turns out uh, you're actually doing a very terrible job because you uh, actually overfit it to the data. That's what this phenomenon uh, on the right is called. It's called overfitting. All right. So what we did in this, uh, this short lecture is we went through a definition of machine learning. We broke it down into three components. So our main component is a task. So this is really what we designed the algorithm to do. And then based on experience, e, we were improving uh, well the performance of, of doing this, this task and how well it was performing that was quantified by some performance measure, p. Okay, now that we're all on the same page about uh, what we mean when we talk about machine learning, let's take a closer look at several subtypes of machine learning. So that's provided in this overview figure over here. So roughly speaking, we make a breakdown of machine learning methods into uh, supervised learning methods, of which we already saw examples in the form of regression and classification. We have unsupervised learning methods. We already saw an example in the form of clustering. And then we have reinforcement learning methods, of which I will later on show an example. Now at this point, I want to, on a high level, make clear the distinction between these three classes of machine learning methods. All methods are based, uh, well, they, they adhere to this definition of machine learning in the sense that they have some tasks to perform and they can improve doing this task based on experience. And in a supervised learning setting, my experience or my data always comes in the form of input, a set of inputs and corresponding targets. So in supervised learning methods, I always have input-output pairs, input-target pairs. Now, what's characteristic of unsupervised learning methods is that actually I only have these inputs. I have a lot of data and I have an algorithm that does something with the data and becomes better at it, but it isn't focusing on predicting or classifying uh, some corresponding labels that come with the data. So in this case, we only have the data, but not necessarily corresponding labels. Uh, we saw an example of that uh, based on clustering. Reinforcement learning methods is a kind of unique class of machine learning uh, methods in the sense that if you look at supervised and unsupervised learning methods, the, the data is provided upfront, like, um, hello algorithm, here is a lot of experience that I've gathered for you, now do your job and improve yourself. So that's sort of uh, the, the, the supervised and unsupervised learning approach. In reinforcement learning methods, experience is, is gained along the way. So uh, let's write it down. Experience or uh, data is gathered along the way. So it's a sort of loose definition, but later on I'll show an example uh, of, of what I actually mean with this. Okay, so uh, we, make, we made a breakdown into three categories. Now, Let's have a closer look into these three different types, starting off with supervised learning. Again, supervised learning methods always come, uh, the data always comes in pairs of input and a corresponding target. In the case of the MNIST uh, digit classification case, we have an input image and a corresponding digit. So in this case, this represents a two, so the target is this uh, digit class two. In a regression case, we also have input target pairs. So we have an input a value on the x-axis and we want to predict the corresponding value on this t, this target axis, whatever this signal represents. So we have an input and a corresponding output and we have a set of points, these blue points over here that represent the data. Now, what distinguishes 
uh, these two methods from one another is the way they deal with targets and the way uh, the kind of problems that they solve. In classification problems, um, we always are interested in turning an input into a corresponding label. And this target, so this target can only take on values in uh, can only take on values of this predefined subset of classes. In the digit classification case, it could only be a zero, a one, and so forth up to a nine. So we could only choose out of ten classes. So that's characteristic of a classification that the output target is a discrete label. What's character characteristic of regression is that these targets can basically take on any value, any numerical value uh, within some interval. In uh, the regression case, we were interested in predicting some real number which represents this vertical axis. So that's characteristic of regression methods that we're predicting continuous outputs. Right, so in the regression case, I could predict for, for this point well, uh, so something over here like a 1.1 um, and anything close to it. But in uh, the classification data set, it doesn't make sense to make a prediction of the digit, like saying, okay, this is the digit 2.5 because it isn't a digit. So it isn't in the class of uh, labels that I consider. Okay, so now what's common in these supervised learning methods is that the objective is always to find some function that maps the input to the corresponding target as close as possible. And we want to, this function to do that for all known data sets, so for our, our, all known data, for our training data, but also for unknown data. And this, I would like to stress this, this reference to unknown data being able to perform well on unknown data refers to generalization. And this is important because, uh, of course, we want our, our, our algorithm to do well on the training data, but also when we deploy it, we, we will encounter data which we haven't seen before and we want it to perform also well on this data. And the example that I gave before, with, which related to overfitting was that, okay, I could fit a function that does very well on my training data, on my known data, but whenever I encounter a new point, for example, over here, um, which is probably then lying somewhere over there, there's a huge difference between what I predict and what is actually there. So we want to avoid these mistakes. We want to avoid overfitting. In other words, we want to generalize to unknown situations. Okay, now let's move on to unsupervised learning methods. All right, so in the unsupervised learning methods, I have a, a data, but I do not have corresponding labels. Uh, still, we can devise algorithms that, uh, that that solve useful tasks. And one of such tasks is compression, All right? So in this example, I'm going to consider compression. Now, why do I want to do this? Uh, imagine you're, you're running a, a website with thousands of user, users and each user has a, a thumbnail image, an avatar image, and you have to save this on your server, but you're cheap, you want to spend little money on this. Um, you're Dutch, <laughs> in other words. <laughs> uh, so you only afford a server that uh, that can save up a couple of megabytes of, of disk space. So and so you cannot afford to save all all of these images, which in this example will be of size 100 by 100. And so you want to reduce the amount of data you, you're going to store. So that's the, that's the goal. So uh, to save on disk space, for example. Now. Now there are uh, several ways of doing compression. In this example, I'll take a closer look at uh, principal component analysis. Um, I won't go into too much specific details, but just want to stick to a high level and the idea of compression in itself. PCA will be covered in chapter 12 and in one of the, the later uh, videos uh, of this course. Now what PCA roughly speaking does, it looks at all the data available and first of all, it looks for a common structure in the data, right? So we have all these images, each has a pair of eyes, a nose and a mouth. And uh, well, we can visualize this commonality by just taking the average of all these images. We average, average these image, images and we get this mean image over here. 
Okay, so this is a sort of generic face, very smooth, smooth uh, skin. Um, it's a face, but it's, it's also generic. So I cannot assign this face to each of my users in the database. Um, so what principal component analysis also does, it looks for differences between these images. It looks for uh, components, principal components, uh, the, which are visualized over here. So sort of, which are also called eigenfaces in the computer vision uh, community which explain the differences between these images. For example, some look a bit more grumpy, uh, not really smiling a lot, some are smiling a lot. And um, so these are variations in the data and these principal components capture these variations in the data. Now let me explain it with an example below. Um, suppose I want to represent this image now in terms of these principal components. I can do that. So I consider this, these principal components as a basis for representing images. So my starting point would, would be to take the average image value, like this mean image, and then I add an amount of the first principal component, that's MS1. So I find a coefficient alpha i, which I assign to this thing, and so I add this component to my mean. And this is the best I can do that comes close to the original image. So I change the skin color a bit, but still it doesn't look so much like me. Um, but if I then add more details, so apparently my face is different enough from this uh, generic uh, average face, so I need to add more variations to it. Um, so I take more and more of these components. Let's say I take 10 of these components, and I see that I can already recover my face more accurately by uh, adding a bit more of, of different components. All right, so I start recognizing my eyes, uh, there's a bit, little bit of beard added, so maybe there's a principal component that accounts for variations in beard or, or fair skin. Um, okay, and, and then we continue. So let's just pick 50 of these uh, principal components because if I look at the second, the MS10 case, uh, there's no smile, there, there needs to be a smile. So uh, I'm looking for my principal components. For example, this one has very dominant teeth in it. So probably in order to achieve an image like this, I need to be add more of this principal component to it. So the, the coefficient, that corresponds to the principal component should be high. Well, and then you see if I consider 50 of these principal components, I'm actually starting to do a pretty accurate job in representing the original image. Still, it's a bit noisy. So just to be sure, I go up to 150 of these components. And what I managed to do is recover the image quite well with only 150 of these, um, of these alpha values. Okay, so what does this tell us? Instead of saving 100 by 100 uh, pixels, so 10,000 of these, these values, I can also just save, um, so I can only just save MS150 alpha coefficients. And this saves me a lot of memory. Now, a separate class of, uh, of unsupervised learning methods uh, is clustering. So we already encountered that uh, in the context of tumor analysis, where the goal was, okay, we want to identify clusters of, of tumor samples that are similar. Uh, we could use this information, for example, to, to adjust our treatment plan, because maybe we know that for some tumors, a particular treatment work well. So we want to use the same treatment for, well, uh, a tumor which is uh, similar. Now, such clustering methods, they're mostly based around the ID that points in my data are similar, and we want to cluster them into these classes. Now, I already went over an example in the, the previous uh, video, so I won't go into too much detail here. But the point is, with clustering, you can recover structure in the data. Now, there's other types of learning methods, uh, something in between supervised and unsupervised learning method, and this is called well, semi-supervised learning. And the idea here is that, again, I have data. So I have data samples x1 up to xn. But now I do not have available the full set of targets. I only have targets available for t1 up to tk, for example, where k is smaller than n. So what this means is I have data. Some of it is labeled and some of, some of it it isn't. Uh, so and and the goal is to really exploit all available data. 
Now, now let's consider, for example, let's consider the example of a classification algorithm that looks for images. In, in, in images, it looks for cats and dogs. And so I have a lot of examples. This is an image of a cat and this is an image of a dog. I also have a lot of images for which I don't have this information. But the idea of unsupervised learning method is to recover the structure of data and recover, um, well, similarities in data. So if I now have a, an image which is very similar to an image of a cat, so it has all the same colors, all the same texture in the image, then I can use this information to assign also the proper label to this image, which probably is, is a, an image of a cat. Okay, so that's the idea of, of super, semi-supervised learning method is try to use all available data that you have. Finally, there's this unique class of machine learning methods uh, called reinforcement learning. In reinforcement learning, um, what I mentioned before, experience is, is gained along the way. So it's still a learning method. It does some task and it becomes better with more and more experience. But instead of providing all the experience or all the data upfront, gaining experience is part of the algorithm. And this is, for example, also how this famous AlphaGo system was trained. Uh, so it was a computer that learned to play the game of Go and it did a pretty good job at it. And basically it was trained in a simulated environment. Uh, the idea is if I want to learn this game, uh, I could read the rule book, but it doesn't make a good play, you need experience. So in such reinforcement learning systems, we always have to deal with the state of the game, of the, 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 well, the state of the environment. So I have all these, these uh, white and black uh, marbles on the board. Uh, so that's the current state. And now you or the computer as an agent is able to take actions. It can put another piece on the board. And so it, it changes its environment. And this induces a change in the state, but it also leads to a reward or a penalty, right? Because by making this action, I, I either gain some ground on the board or I lose some. I gain some points or I lose some points. And this is then experience, which I can use later on. If it was a good move, then I should remember it Maybe I should try this again uh, next time. If it was a bad mood, uh, move, then you remember not to do it uh, again. So such learning methods are typically uh, based on the concept of, of trial and error. Now, applications are mainly in, in the context of games. Uh, this, this ranges from, from chess to, to Starcraft or other strategic uh, uh, games. And the reason for this is that they uh, operate in a virtual environment. And this is really convenient for reinforcement learning methods because if you make mistakes in a virtual environment, well, first of all, you can simulate what this uh, action leads to, uh, but also you're not harming your environment. You're only harming a virtual environment in case you make a mistake. Whereas in the practical world, you cannot always afford to make mistakes uh, or not too often or not too severe mistakes. So it's quite a challenge to move this to the practical world, but uh, there are some examples of reinforcement learning uh, being used, for example, uh, in the context of uh, robotics. Okay, that, that's all I have to say for the moment about machine learning. Just want to mention that we have a second year's master course on this topic. So if you're interested, uh, take a look at that. All right, so let me conclude with this, again with this definition of machine learning. Uh, recall that a machine learning algorithm is designed to perform some task and it becomes better uh, with more and more experience. And uh, we just went over three of these examples or three classes, supervised learning methods, unsupervised learning and reinforcement learning. Um, well, if you take a closer look at that, uh, maybe you paid attention to it throughout the talk. All of these classes are indeed types of machine learning. In this video, I will continue going over some of the core definitions in probability theory. Specifically, I will define the expected value, variance and covariance. Then I will go over one of the most widely used probability distributions out there, namely the Gaussian distribution. This is a parametric prob probability distribution, which we will encounter throughout this course. So it will definitely pay off to pay attention now. Um, now, this Gaussian distribution will also serve as an example for explicitly computing the expectation and variance. Okay, so let's start with uh, the expectation. 
Now remember, we're talking probability theory here, so uh, we, we're dealing with random variables. Again, this random variable uh, can take on some value denoted with small x out of a set of all possible outcomes denoted with capital X. Now, some outcomes are more prob probable than others, and we denote this by saying that uh, x is a random variable with respect to some probability probability distribution uh, p of x. Now, expectations are computed uh, from functions, uh, so functions from x to r. Okay, so then the expectation is defined as follows. So we compute the expectation of f of x, uh, where x is a random variable uh, with respect to this uh, probability distribution. In the discrete case, it is defined simply as the sum over all possible outcomes of this function f of x weighted with the probability of x. In the continuous setting, we have a similar definition. Now the, uh, the sum becomes an integral, so we integrate over the entire domain x, this function f of x weighted with the corresponding probability p of x dx. Okay, so these are two definitions. One is for the discrete setting, and the other is for the continuous setting. Now we do not always have direct access to this uh, probability distribution, uh, but we could still make an uh, approximation of this expectation. And we do so by again, sort of adopting this uh, frequentist uh, viewpoint of things. So we make n uh, observations. So let's write this. So one observation x1, x2. So we observe capital N number of these uh, random variables. Then uh, from all these observations, we can make an uh, approximation of the expectation simply by taking the average over all samples. So from N is one to capital N, um, the function values evaluated on these samples. Okay, so this is really just computed the mean, computing the mean. And remember that in this frequentist uh, point of view, the probabilities were really defined as the fraction of times that I observe one of these uh, random variables, one of these values that the random variable uh, takes on. Uh, so the fraction of time. And you can imagine that this sort of, in this frequency setting, indeed, we have that um, maybe some values for x happen more often, so they contribute more to this sum. So we have a sort of weighted sum where um, each value is weighted by the number of times that uh, this value is observed. Now expectations are always computed uh, in the context of random variables uh, with respect to some probability distribution. And this probability distribution can also be conditional. Uh, so we have actually the same definition here in a discrete case, we sum over all possible outcomes x, uh, so this uh, function values of x, weighted by the conditional probability of x, given that I already made an observation um, y. In the continuous setting, we have the same definition, but now we integrate f of x and we weight it with the conditional probability. Okay, so these are definitions of the expected value and it can be interpreted as a weighted mean where uh, the weight is uh, according to the probability of particular samples uh, being observed. Okay, now let's define the variance. The variance is defined as the expected quadratic distance between f and its mean, and the mean is denoted with this expected value of f. Okay, so let's write out what the statement says. We're computing the expected value of the distance, the square distance of f of x to its mean. and this squared, so the expected value of the square distance. Okay, so really this is the definition. And what I'm going to do next, I'm going to uh, write this out and show that this variance actually splits in two separate terms. And these two separate terms will often be more convenient to work with. Um, okay, so let, let's just do that. So let's write out this expectation of this uh, quadratic term over here. So that gives us the term f of x squared minus two f of x times the expectation of f uh, plus 
the expectation of f of x squared. Now before I continue, I just want to remark that the expected value is a linear operator. So if I take the expected value of two functions, the sum of two functions, then this splits in the expected value of f plus the expected value of g. Okay, so this is relatively straightforward to show. The same uh, for, uh, let's say, if I scale a function f of x, let's write it out. So uh, in the discrete setting we have, we take the sum of x, c times f of x, weighted with the probability of x, the c can be moved to the front, and then we see that we indeed we have that we can scale the expected value. Uh, finally, um, the expected value of some constant, so it doesn't depend on x, is simply given by uh, this constant, right? Because um, the sum over all probabilities equals one, so the expected value of a constant would give us the constant itself. Okay, so with these properties in place, we can show that this expected value can be split into three terms. So we have the expected value of f of x squared. Then um, this is a constant, this two is a constant, so both can be moved outside and then I compute the expected value of f of x. So this would actually give us an extra expected value f of x. And uh, let's just write that. So the expected value f of x times these two terms. So minus two. Um, yeah, so this becomes a square plus the expected value of f of x squared, right? Because once we compute the expected value, it becomes a constant. It's no longer depending on x. So, uh, and then we take the expected value of this constant, which just gives me this thing. So we have these three terms. Uh, we gather uh, terms of the same form. So we actually have the following. Okay, so what we see, um, so what we did, we have this definition. So the variance is defined as the expected value of the quadratic distance between f and its mean. And this variance can be split into the expected value of f squared minus the square of the expected value of f. Okay, so let's go over a quick example to, to get a visual impression of what we're dealing with here. So suppose we have a random variable, x, which is drawn from a uniform distribution on the interval 0, 1. So that means that I'm going to sample points between 0 and 1, and each point is equally likely uh, to occur. Then uh, I have a function of x, so f is a function on this random variable. So let, let's just draw a function, suppose it, it looks like this. Then of this we can compute its expected value, so that will be its mean. And each point contributes equally well to this uh, mean, so we really have this particular uh, straight line. So this will be the expected value of f, where this blue line will be f of x. Um, now, when we compute the variance, we take a look at the square distance of each point f of x to its mean. And that would give us uh, this particular variance of f of x. Uh, now, suppose I would have a different signal. Uh, let's say it looks like this. It's almost constant. So we call this uh, g of x. Also of this, we can compute its mean. It may look something like this. So that's the expected value of g. We can compute the variance. So the square distance of each of these fx values to the mean. And in this particular case, I would obtain a low variance g of x. Whereas in, compar in comparison, uh, the top one would be a large uh, variance. Right, so the variance really captures the amount of variations in my data relative to the expected value. So that's it for the variance. We can also talk about covariance. Covariance measures the extent to which two random variables, x and y, vary together. So let me just uh, give the definition straight away. So we compute the expected value of these two random variables, 
defined relative to this uh, joint probability distribution. So we compute the expected value of x relative to its mean times y relative to its mean. So similar to the, to the variance case, we compute the expected value of some uh, quadratic form. And also this particular quadratic form can be split into uh, these two components. So let's take a look at how this works. So we compute the expected value of x times y minus x expected value of y minus y expected value of x. Uh, let's see, plus the expected value of x times the expected value of y. And also of this thing, of course, we, we can uh, use these linearity properties, which gives us this first term, the expectation of x times y. And we have uh, these three terms, which actually all give the expectation of x times the expectation of I, well, uh, y. So let's, get, let's gather this, and this would give us the following. Okay, so what we did here, we gave a definition of the covariance. The covariance measures uh, the extent to which two random variables x and y vary together. And also this covariance can be split into two separate terms. Now we also want to be able to deal with uh, vectors of random variables x and y. So these x and y are random vectors. And we want to be able to, to measure the covariance uh, between them. And this covariance uh, between these two vectors is defined as follows. So again, let's denote that x and y are defined relative to some probability distribution. Then we take the expected value of x relative to its mean times y relative to its mean. But these are vectors and I'm going to put a transpose over here. Now, what does this mean? So uh, we have this over here, this is a vector. It is, so vectors we consider as column vectors. So this will be a vector with d rows and one column. Um, for the y, we applied a transpose. So this will be a row vector of one by d. And that means that this entire um, covariance thing becomes a covariance matrix. So this will be of size r d by d. Now each element uh, in this matrix then encodes for the amount of variation uh, between each of the components of the, the two uh, random vectors. Also this uh, covariance matrix breaks down into two components, namely the expected value of x y transpose minus the expected value of x times the expected value of y and this thing transpose. Okay, so this is the definition of the covariance matrix. And also this covariance breaks down into two separate terms. Now let's uh, think about this for a moment. So the covariance uh, measures the amount of, of covariance between two uh, random variables. Uh, before we encountered so-called independent variables. So independent variables were defined as, uh, in a loose way, they do not influence each other. Uh, so we expect actually that this covariance matrix between two independent random variables will be zero. Okay, so let's write this out uh, and show that this is actually the case. Now, what do we know about independent variables? Let's say X and Y. Uh, we know that uh, their joint probability distribution, X and Y, breaks down or splits into independent distributions. Okay, now let's just compute the covariance. So the covariance is given as the expected value of x times y minus the expected value of x times the expected value of y. Now let's have a look at this uh, first term. So we just fill in the definition of the expectation. So we compute the integral over x and y of this function xy weighted with this joint probability distribution dx dy. Okay, now the joint probability splits in, in two terms. So we have the integral over x, we have the integral over y, x, y, px, by, dx, dy. 
Now we can split this integral into two separate parts, one only depending on x and the other only depending on y. That would give us the integral x px dx, and for the other one the integral over y py dy. And this we recognize as two individual expectations. The expectation over x times the expectation over y. Okay, so now we can plug this right back in, back in and we see that indeed the covariance uh, between two independent variables is indeed equal to zero. Okay, this is an important uh, thing to know, the covariance between two independent variables equals to zero. But it's also very important to realize that um, measuring a covariance of zero does not necessarily mean that you're dealing with independent random variables. So we showed it one direction, so if you have independent variables, the covariance is zero, but the other way around, this is not necessarily the case, that if we measure covariance zero, that the x and y are independent. And I'm going to show that with a counterexample. Suppose my x is drawn from a uniform distribution on the interval minus one to one. So that really means that the probability for each of these x values, which can take on the values between minus one and one, is given by a constant. Uh, specifically, it's given by a half. Okay, so this is my first random variable, and then I define a second one, y is x squared. So this y clearly depends on x squared. It's there in the definition, y is x squared. Now, if we compute the covariance between them, so let's do that. So the covariance between x and y is given by the expected value of x times y minus the expected value of x, expected value of y, we will see that this equals to zero. And why is this the case? So this first term involves an integral from minus one to one of x to the power three, right? Because we multiply x with x squared, and this is weighted with a constant probability of a half. Now this integral equals uh, integrates to zero because we have an odd function which is integrated over an, over an even domain. Okay, so we can get rid of this term, this term becomes zero. Similarly, the expectation of x, x is also a, an odd function, uh, becomes zero. So both become zero because they are odd functions. Okay, so this is also important to remember that if you measure covariance zero, this does not necessarily imply that x and y are independent. Uh, finally, you may encounter uh, a notation like this, the covariance of x, that is then implicitly understood to be the covariance between x and itself, because the covariance is always a measure between two random variables. Now let's talk about the Gaussian distribution. Throughout this course, we have encountered distributions in all these definitions, but never really took a, took a closer look at what these look like. We did, however, take a frequentist approach to these distributions and gave an example of apples and oranges, but now we move to a more Bayesian point of view, and this allows us to deal with continuous random variables. In this Bayesian approach, we will model probabilities using parametric distributions. These are distributions with an analytic description that allows us to control what the distribution looks like. Now, the Gaussian distribution is one of the most widely used parametric distributions and we will use it throughout this course. This is what it's going to look like. So we have that uh, the Gaussian distribution, also called, often called the normal distribution, hence this n, it's a distribution with respect to a random variable x. And it is parameterized by this mu parameter, which we, which we will refer to as the mean. And we have the sigma squared, which we will refer to as the variance. Uh, now this is what it looks like. It has this front factor, square root of two pi sigma squared, and this exponential one over two sigma squared times x minus mu squared. Okay, so what are we looking at? So we have this mu parameter over here. This mu parameter really determines the location of the maximum of this distribution. Uh, because what we're looking at here is the square distance of our variable x to this mu. And if x is close to mu, 
then uh, the square distance is close to zero and then e to the power of zero, um, well, it will be close to one. So if we move further away from u, this distance will increase and then we have e to the power minus something very large. So the probabilities will decay to zero if we move away from mu. Now a sigma squared or sigma determines the width of this distribution. If sigma is very small, then uh, we actually really only consider assigning high probabilities to points that are close to mu. And as soon as we leave the vicinity of mu, this thing will decay to zero because this thing quite rapidly becomes very large. Um, yeah, and if sigma becomes very large, then we get a very wide distribution and then we start um, more equally assigned probabilities to all of these values on, on the x-axis. Still, they decay to zero if we move away from mu. Then we're looking at a distribution and distributions are normalized to integrate to one. So if we integrate this distribution with respect to its random variable x, this entire thing should evaluate to one. And that's why we have this correction term up front. So we have a mean parameter. This determines the location of the maximum of this distribution. And we have a variance parameter, which determines the width of this distribution. Now I've been calling this parameter mu the mean of the distribution. And I do this for a reason, because if we actually compute the mean, if we compute the expected value of x, which is random relative to this normal distribution, we can show that this mean becomes mu. So now we have an analytic form of the distribution. Let's actually do this computation. Let's actually compute the expected value. Okay, so this is what we do. We compute the integral from minus infinity to infinity of x weighted by its probability. So multiplied this Gaussian distribution. Now this uh, integral looks quite complicated. It's hard to compute, so we're going to simplify it and we do this via a change of variables. So I'm going to make a clever choice here that significantly reduces uh, this integral. So I choose y is one over the square root of two sigma uh, squared times x minus mu. And I do this because if I insert this in, in the equation, then actually this exponential becomes e to the power minus y squared. Of course, we also need to substitute for the other instances of x. So let's see what x should be. This basically defines x to be um, the square root of two sigma squared times y plus mu. Okay, so let's plug it in into the equation. Okay, and now also we have to take a look at this integration measure. So let's see, dy dx is given by one over two sigma squared, uh, the square root of it. So dx has to be square root of two sigma squared dy. So we plug it in. Now this already looks a bit more friendly. Uh, we can clean it up. We can get rid of these terms, these factor out. And what we get is, and what we get is the integral of two components, really. So we're computing now the integral of uh, two functions. One is an odd function. So this is y times the exponential of uh, minus y squared. So this is an even function. This is an odd function. So this becomes an uneven or an odd function. And we know that if we integrate odd functions from minus infinity to infinity, the left part of the domain cancels out the positive part. So we actually know that this thing, this part of the integral will evaluate to zero. Now that greatly simplifies our uh, integral. Now we only have to look at the integral of e to the power minus uh, y squared. And for this, we're going to make use of this property that this integral evaluates to the square root of pi. So that gives us mu divided by the square root of pi times the square root of pi is mu. Okay, so what I showed is if we actually compute the expected value of x, where x is a random variable relative to, to this Gaussian distribution, which is parameterized by a mu and a sigma squared, we actually obtain that this expected value becomes mu. 
Now this is quite an exercise, but the main point is that I wanted to show you an example of how to explicitly compute the expected value and show you that given an, an analytic or parametric form of a distribution, we can indeed analytically derive solutions. There's no magic to it, but it does require some mathematical practice. And I show this example because throughout this course, uh, we will work with Gaussian distributions a lot. We will make use of formulas that are based on derivations like these. And the least I hope for is that when the book or me in one of the talks explains that some property or some statement is true and that the proof has its origins in computations like these, uh, I hope that you believe of what I'm saying is true because of, well, you showed an ex I showed an example just now. Uh, that's the very least I hope for. But what I really hope for is that next time when I say this follows from this and this and this, that you verify this yourself. Because I truly believe that making such computations yourself is the best way to really master the theory. Okay, with that said, let's have a closer look at the variance. Notice that before I already referred to this particular sigma square term as uh, the variance. And I did so because when we explicitly compute the variance of a random variable defined relative to this Gaussian distributions, uh, we indeed uh, come to the fact that this variance evaluates to sigma squared. So we're going to show that the variance of x is going to be sigma squared. Okay, so let's compute this thing. We're computing the expected value. So from minus infinity to infinity, we integrate x minus its mean squared weighted with the probability. So weighted with this Gaussian distribution. Again, we're going to simplify this integral by doing the same change of variables. So x minus mu squared will become, uh, let's see, two sigma squared y squared. And then we have this front factor. The exponential becomes e to the power minus y squared. And the integration measure had this uh, factor two sigma squared dy in it. Again, let's uh, factor out these terms. So this is the integral that we have to compute. So we're mainly looking at a function that looks like y squared times e to the power e minus y squared. And again, we're going to make use of our mathematical experience. In this particular case, I showed it here. We're going to use this convenience trick. This is the integral that we need to compute. And we make this identification that if we have an integral of e to the power uh, minus a x squared, if you take the derivative with respect to a, this x squared pops up in the front and we obtain the integral we are interested in. Now this integral we know how to compute. It evaluates to square root of pi over a, where this a is sort of obtained by the substitution of variable uh, trick. And then we compute its derivative. So we have a way of actually analytically computing the integral of this thing, and it evaluates to a half square root of pi over a to the power three. Now in our particular case, a will be equal to one. And we know then that this integral, so we have this constant over here. And we have the solution of the integral, which is given by a half square root of pi. So we see that this entire variance evaluates to sigma squared. And that's why we call sigma squared the variance of the Gaussian distribution. So let's summarize this. The Gaussian distribution is defined in the following way. It consists of this exponential, which consists of uh, computing the, the square distance of x to mu. And this is scaled with the sigma parameter. So mu determines the location of the maximum and sigma makes it wider or smaller. And this is a normalization uh, factor that makes sure that this distribution integrates to one if we integrate over the random variable. Uh, then we showed that indeed if a variable x uh, is drawn from such a distribution, then the expected value of x is given by mu. So that's the mean parameter and the variance is given by sigma squared. Finally, I, I would like to point out that uh, the Gaussian distribution is also defined in the multivariate case. So if we're dealing with multidimensional vectors. So now my x consists of all these components x1 up to xd. So I have a column vector of uh, variables. Now the Gaussian distribution takes almost the exact same form, except now um, we have 
well, that the, that the mean is also a vector, and the sigma becomes a matrix, a covariance matrix. So what you see here, if you're familiar with, with geometry, this looks like a Riemannian metric, where we scale the distance between X and mu with some uh, anisotropic metric. And here we have this factor that makes sure that this uh, distribution integrates to one. And actually there is a vertical line missing here. Now we do not take the square root of sigma, but we take the square root of the determinant of sigma. So the determinant is denoted with this. Okay, so also here we have the parameter mu, which represents the mean. We have this sigma, capital sigma here, which is called the covariance matrix. And this covariance matrix, so really this sigma is the covariance of x with itself. Now this is something we can prove, like we can explicitly compute the covariance with respect to this multivariate Gaussian distribution, just like we did in the previous cases. But this is quite a tedious task. And I would like to refer to chapter 2.3 if you want to get a better understanding of where this covariance uh, comes from. Yeah, now this covariance matrix is a D by D uh, matrix, and it determines the shape of the distribution. It can make it anisotropic in one direction and can make it elongated in one of the other directions. Okay, now also for this case, let's go over some computations that explicitly compute the expected value of x. So we're going to compute this integral over the entire domain Rd of x weighted with this uh, Gaussian. Now we can simplify this integral again by doing a change of variables. Now we simply choose uh, y to be x minus mu. Now in that case, the integral reduces to the integral of over Rd of z y plus mu times this entire distribution. Now there's two things uh, to be said about this. First of all, uh, we're looking at the product of an odd function with this even function. So uh, the integration domain is symmetric, so these terms cancel out. So we only need to focus on this mu, which is a constant, and integrating this entire thing. And what we look at here is actually a Gaussian distribution with average with mu zero. So this is really a distribution with some parameters. And we know from Gaussian distributions that they integrate to one if we integrate over uh, the variable, the random variable y in this case. So we know that this thing integrates to one. So that would actually give us the result that the expected value of x is given by mu. Okay, good to know. Also in the multivariate case, the expected value of a random variable x defined relative to this normal or Gaussian distribution is given by this parameter mu. In this week, we're going to discuss in detail our first supervised machine learning method, namely linear regression. While the first week had a strong focus on probability theory, of which a proper understanding is essential in order to be able to, to deal with uncertainties, uh, but it also gave us a way to formalize uh, when we think a system is optimal or when it is most probable. Uh, we worked in a relatively abstract setting without going into full details of how these models were precisely parameterized, but in this week, we will, we will make things more explicit and explain how to construct and actually compute with linear regression models. Now, in the first two lectures, three principles for probabilistic learning were discussed. We defined optimality criteria for when we consider a probabilistic model to be appropriate. It was either the model that gave the most likely explanation of the data, leading to the maximum likelihood principle, or, or we selected the model that was most probable given the data. This was the maximum a posteriori approach. Um, but we could also go fully Bayesian and define, define the, the predictive distributions to be the weighted average of all possible predictive distributions. Now, central in all cases was that we work with uh, predictive distributions of the following form. So we had some input x and we want to assign probabilities for all uh, possible target values well, given this input x. And we model this uh, via Gaussian distributions or normal distributions. 
which had the following form. So we had the normal distribution with respect to the random variable t, which was parameterized by some mean and some variance or some uh, inverse precision, right? And uh, where this, this mean actually derived from a modeling approach where we assume there's a, some clear relation between input x and target variable, uh, variable uh, t. But in the previous lectures, we sort of skipped over this part. Uh, so we sort of said, okay, we, there exists such a model and we're going to optimize it using these three principles uh, that I just uh, uh, mentioned. But we didn't uh, go into full details on how to obtain these, uh, these actual models y of x parameterized uh, by w. And that's what we're going to do today. Now recall that regression is a machine learning task where we want to make predictions uh, given some input. So we're dealing with the data consists of input output pairs. And in the regression case, these outputs are a continuous uh, variable. So we want to predict some continuous value. So what we're going to do, we'll consider the input variables to be vectors in RD. So each input data point is a vector is a d-dimensional vector. And now my output, I'm going to say that the corresponding output is just going to be some number. So I'm only considering scalar uh, target values uh, today, but this of course generalizes also to predicting multiple values at the same time. Okay, now let's think of a, a concrete example. Suppose my task is to predict house prices and I'm given uh, the floor area, I'm given the age or the building uh, year of the house maybe how big is the garden. So all these uh, parameters can be stacked into one input uh, vector, right? So I have D measurements or variables on which I'm going to base my prediction and my prediction will be the house price. So just one number. Now the simplest linear model I can think of is just assigning weights to each of these uh, input uh, values. So that would be W0, that's a bias term plus W1 times the first component plus W2 times the second component and so on. And I assign a weight to each of these uh, data elements. Now there's some ambiguity that needs to be resolved with respect to these indices. Uh, I noticed that I'm using indices here, an index XI that denotes the i data point. So uh, the i data point where each data point was a vector in RD. But now here the index refers to the comp component within this vector. So let me just quickly clarify this. So here the index refers to component within the vector, within the d-dimensional vector. Right, so uh, I denote a vector with uh, an underscore. So x underscore is an r d dimensional vector. And then without an underscore, this is one component of such a vector. So let's ju just write this out. So I say that x is a vector um, that looks like this, x1, x2, up to xd. Okay. Um, now, actually, sometimes it may be more convenient to work with this uh, vector form. Actually, quite often it is. So let's just write a simple linear model into this vector form. Then we have a set of weights, which we can um, set to be W1, W2, WD. Okay, let these be our weights and inputs, uh, respectively. Then I can write this linear model. I can write it as my bias plus my w transpose x. Now I can actually switch to full vector notation because now I still, for, sometimes it's convenient to write this fully out as one uh, scalar product. Now I still have this bias term in here, but I could include this bias term in my weight vector. So let's do it. Let's add a zeroed component to this. Let's denote this with uh, w tilde, for example. Uh, the same for x tilde, but now I'm going to add a 1. And I'm going to do this because then I can write this linear model simply as w tilde transpose x tilde, right? Because now we have 
w0 times 1 plus w1 times x1, w2 times x2, etc. And I would then I would update my, my linear model. Okay, so so sometimes we're going to use this extra prepended uh, bias. So we include the bias in the set of, of weights and sometimes we, we treat it separately. It should be clear from context, um, otherwise we mention it. But the main point is here, we have a linear model and a linear model means that I'm just going to take linear combinations of my input vector, where I assign one weight to each uh, vector component. Okay, so let's make a drawing of, of what this uh, could look like. Uh, again, let's talk about predicting house prices. Uh, let's say we have only one measurement, uh, for example, uh, the floor area. So this is my input x, and x is now just uh, some scalar value. And I'm going to predict the house price with it. House price. And now I have all these measurements. So I have this huge data point database of data points, which I already see from this plot. I see that the house price increases with, uh, well, with the floor area. And now I'm going to make a predictive distribution or a predictive function that describes this process that, that maps each input parameter, so the floor area to the corresponding house price. So I'm going to fit a model to it. Okay, so now uh, I'm considering linear model, so I can only take linear combinations of my input uh, variable with some bias terms. So I have my weights, which looks like um, a weight zero and a weight one, and my input, let's say it consists of this constant one and um, x1, which was the floor area. Now suppose I would only fit um, the bias term, so uh, that then maybe this is the best I can do. This will be the case that my bias is fitted, so it's unequal to zero, but my linear component, I'm going to set it uh, for zero for, for the time being. Okay, that's, so that's not, not a good fit because it's just constant. Um, let's try a different model. Let's say we only uh, tune the, the W1 parameter, then maybe this is uh, the best I can do. So let's fix my bias and let's tune my W1 uh, parameter. So you see neither of the two is a good fit. So of course we have to fit the full model to it, which is going to be a combination of a linear component. So the slope of this curve and a bias, which enables uh, this, uh, this offset over here. And this, this slope is determined by uh, W1. Okay, so with an appropriate set of uh, weights, I can model this. So I can come up with a model that maps each in input x uh, to a corresponding output given my, my weights. And of course, this works well if we indeed have such a linear relation that uh, the prices nicely scale uh, with the floor area. But suppose this isn't the case. Suppose my data looks something like this. So again, we have a floor area, we have house prices, and my data points look like this. So like initially my house, pr house prices increase with square meter, but at some point it saturates. I don't know, uh, maybe at some point people cannot afford uh, a house which is too big. So the house prices start to saturate. I think this sort of makes sense. But the point is now, of course I can make a linear model fit. So I could maybe fit something over here, uh, but this would give me a very poor fit in this region. I could, uh, maybe fit on this part, uh, on the saturated part, uh, but that obviously wouldn't describe well uh, this behavior over here. So actually, to ac to be able to act accurately describe this phenomenon, I'm going to need something better than just a linear model. So actually, I want to model this thing over here. Now, it turns out that we cannot describe such a model with just taking linear combinations of the input. But what we could do, we could first transform the input to a new set of values, to a new set of, let's say, measurements, and then define a linear model on this. And this would actually give me a way to come up still with linear models of x parameterized by a set of w's that describe this phenomenon. And we're going to do that via basis functions. And I hope I can make this clear in the upcoming uh, slides. So the approach is as follows. We still work with a fixed number of parameters. Let's denote this with capital M. So I have my weights, my weight factors, 
of my, or my weight vector is a vector of size m. Now I'm going to choose m minus 1 basis functions of features of x. So this means I have this phi of x and it returns a new feature. So what does this thing do? Each of these basis functions takes as input a d-dimensional, uh, my input vector, and spits out a new feature value. And we'll see in a minute a bit more concretely uh, what this actually means, well, what these basis functions actually do. Uh, but now I have these basis functions and I have an index i that runs from um, 1 to m minus 1. Then my approximation is going to be as follows. So again, I have this uh, bias term over here, plus now I'm going to make linear combinations. Uh, so I'm going to assign a corresponding weight to each of these new feature uh, values that were obtained through by pulling these uh, inputs x through this basis uh, function. Okay, so here w0 is a bias. And now we're going to switch back to, to vector notation. So I'm going to define this thing over here. And this is going to be the connect, well, the, the concatenations of all these newly obtained feature uh, values. So I'll denote it as this. So this is going to be phi 0, phi 1. So I'm really stacking all these new features on top of each other. And minus 1, x this thing transpose, it's going, it is going to be a column vector. Now I defined this first basis function is always going to return the value one. And by doing so, uh, we saw that before, uh, by doing so we can incorporate the weights, uh, well, this bias inside the weight vector. And that will give me the following, uh, the following formula. So now my predictive model is still a linear model that looks like this, W transpose, and then the scalar product with uh, this newly obtained feature vector, right? So I'm always going to write underscore for uh, for vectors so, because I cannot write boldface. <laughs> That's the, the main reason. Okay, so if I write this out, uh, this thing corresponds to this thing over here, right? So I have w0 times 1 because my first basis function was always 1 and I have w1 times well, my first basis function, w2 times the second basis function, and so on. Okay, so we put this in, 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 in vector notation. Now, think again about what kind of objects we're dealing with here. So this thing over here, this phi um, underscore, so this vector uh, phi, it takes as input a data point, which was a d-dimensional uh, vector, and it turns this into an m-dimensional vector because each basis function took as input, so each fi took as input this d-dimensional vector and just spit out one new number. And if I stack them on top of each other, I will have m of these uh, new values. So I have a vector of size m. Okay, so this gives me a way to change the dimensionality of my data. So suppose I have only uh, a scalar, let's say floor area, I can turn this into m variations of floor area, let's say floor area squared to the power 3, uh, etc. So let's take a look at some options that we have for the corresponding basis functions. Let's say my basis functions are these projection operators, which takes as input the full vector x and projects it to one of its components. So the i basis function selects only the i uh, component. And in this case, the number of basis functions uh, equals the dimensionality of my, my vectors, right? For each component, I have one basis function. And then if I write this out, so this was my formula for my basis function uh, regression model. So I have uh, a bias term plus the sum over these basis functions, where I apply this weight to each individual basis function. Um, and yeah, so, I'm just going to write out this basis function and that would give me w0 plus the sum i s1 to m of w i x i. So we see uh, with such a projection uh, based 
basis function, I just reobtain my linear regression model. So this doesn't really get us anywhere, but it will get us started on, on the idea of basis functions. Now let's consider the basis functions to be these power maps, these i power maps. So meaning that the i basis function takes x to the power i. Well, what, what would that give us? It would give us again this bias term plus w1 times x to the power 1 plus w2 times x to the power 2 plus w3 x to the power 3 etc. So if we choose the basis functions to be these i power maps um, I get a polynomial regression problem and I again can formulate this into a vector notation a w transpose scalar product with my uh, basis uh, vector where this vector was the collection of, of, of these values for the basis function. So phi of x is given by 1, x, x squared, x to the 3, etc. Okay, so let's look at an example. So now my polynomial basis consists of these basis functions. The, uh, the first basis function is just a constant. The second basis function is this uh, linear slope. The third will be this quadratic form. And then the third, this one. And now uh, I'm going to define a model. I'm going to construct a model by assigning weights to each of these newly obtained feature vectors. That would give us the function mapping on the right. So if I'm going to tune, tune uh, the bias term, I will, will, will get an offset. If I'm going to tune the first component, I can add a slope. Uh, let's move it back. And then if I would tune the, the second weight, I would add this quadratic term to it. So I can make all these linear combinations of these basis function. So you see, now I'm actually constructing quite complicated functions just by taking linear combinations of uh, what I constructed with these basis functions. Okay, and this is still called linear regression because now I'm going to take linear uh, combinations of my uh, basis functions of these newly obtained feature vectors uh, with some w. So with respect to w, this problem is completely linear. But with respect to x, I now obtain a non-linear mapping from x to my output y. Uh, so this non-linearity is obtained via a clever choice of what my basis looks like. And in this case, I considered a polynomial basis. So now still this choice for basis function, that's a, cho that's a choice I have to make. It's, we can consider it a hyperparameter. Now I can make many choices and some choices are more suitable uh, for one problem and the others are more suitable for another problem. Um, I'm just going over some examples of basis functions that you encounter uh, quite often. And one of those is the Gaussian basis function. Um, it, which consists of Gaussian functions, but without this correcting um, coefficient in front of it, because if I multiply this with the W, this correction factor or this front factor can be absorbed within W. So I'm not going to need that. Uh, so these basis functions look like this. It's these exponential, which have some offset, some mean. So this is a Gaussian blob, this exponential blob centered around some mean, and it has the shape determined by this co covariance matrix. Okay, so I'm considering d-dimensional input vectors and each basis function takes one of these input vector and spits out a new number, which can be thought of as proximity towards uh, to this, uh, these mean values. Uh, and these means are really hyperparameters that I pick myself. So I'm going to design a bunch of uh, basis functions that look like this. And then my linear model uh, with respect to W looks like this. So I have again my bias term plus a sum over all these basis functions. I assign a weight to each of these basis function minus a half x minus mu i transpose inverse covariance matrix. Okay, and this looks something like this. Okay, so this is what the basis functions look like now. Again, I have this uh, bias term, so the constant one function, and then I have these shifted uh, uh, Gaussian blobs. And I'm considering the 1D case, right? So in each uh, Gaussian or each exponential is centered around some point. This one is centered around minus three over four. Uh, this one is centered around minus one over four uh, and so on. So I have all these shifted basis functions. And now I'm going to make linear combinations of this. And that's, that allows me to, to construct functions that 
are more localized. So each basis function only considered a localized region. For example, in this region, I would say an increase with respect to my target value, followed by a decrease, uh, followed by an increase, and maybe an even uh, higher increase. Um, again, so now I'm going to make linear combinations of my basis function. So it's still a linear regression problem. But uh, with respect to input variable x, the, the, the function y is highly nonlinear. Okay, so we see that each basis function has its own set of properties. The Gaussians are more localized, but we could also work with, for example, with logistic sigmoid functions. And whereas the Gaussians are really localized, the logistic sigmoid functions can be used to focus on regions, like threshold regions. Uh, I'll, I'll give the example in a minute. But these logistic sigmoid functions, they look like this. 1 over 1 plus e to the power minus x. Let's consider the 1D case again. And then we can uh, shift these functions with a mu i parameter and we can scale them. Okay, so these logistic sigmoids look like this. Suppose I consider one of these basis functions. It has a particular um, offset point. So these are like smooth indicator functions where which assign 0 to a region below this threshold and 1 above this threshold. And there's this smooth transitioning going on which can be controlled with a steepness parameter. I can make this transition, uh, transition very smooth. But if I make S very small, then it becomes very steep. I make a very quick transition. And then mu i determines the location of this transition. And you can imagine that these kind of basis functions are ideal for working with stepwise uh, functions. Or let's say um, my predicted label is only valid for some region. So let's say the house prices are, <laughs> uh, let, let's put some constant. My house prices are constant. But for some region, all of a sudden, if the square meter goes from, let's say, uh, 100 square meter to 500, I have a constant price. And after that, the houses become cheap again. It's, of course, uh, completely unrealistic, but <laughs> I couldn't come up with a better example just now. The point is, with these logistic sigmoid functions, we can, again, generate quite interesting functions simply by taking a linear combinations of these uh, basis functions. So it's a linear model, but the resulting predicted predictive function is uh, highly nonlinear. Okay, so I showed several of these basis functions, uh, and basically these are choices that you make in your model. I'm, uh, my choice is to work with a particular type of basis function. So we call, this is a choice, so we call it the hyperparameter uh, in some sense. And then each basis function in itself could also consist of several hyperparameters, like these offsets and these scales. So we call these things, we call them hyperparameters. Uh, same here, like this, this mu, the location of these uh, Gaussians and uh, their, their, their shapes or the covariance matrix are hyperparameters. And they're called so because they are not automatically set. Like the weights, um, so these weights, they are automatically obtained via some approach, via least squares regression or via uh, maximum a posteriori uh, optimization. But these things, we set them by hands typically. Uh, so that's why we call them hyperparameters. Okay, so we've covered a bunch of uh, different types of basis functions. So we consider polynomials, which look like this. Each height basis function was basically x to the power i. Where in this illustration, x is really just one, a one-dimensional input. Uh, so that gives me a basis function for the linear slope, for a parabola, for third order, um, like x cubed, uh, and so on. So this gives me a polynomial basis. Then we saw an example of a Gaussian basis functions, which looks like this. So each basis, each i basis function consists of a exponential 1 over 2 sigma squared so that's the, the size or the scale of the Gaussian x minus mu i and it was centered around some particular uh, centered around some particular mu i and these basis functions have the property that they're highly localized so that that could be a very convenient uh, property uh, to work with and and then we had logistic sigmoid functions so um, where sigma is defined to be the logistic sigmoid, so the smooth indicator function, and it could be scaled with some steepness uh, parameter. So mu i in this case determines uh, the offset, and then uh, s determines the slope 
of this uh, basis function. Now each class of basis function has its own properties and it's up to you as a designer of such, uh, such machine learning algorithms to, to pick the one that suits your problem best. In this video we're going to discuss how to do model selection. For example, when working on a regression problem, we have choices to make with respect to the type and amount of basis functions and the amount of regularization. And now you want to know which choice is better than others, right? You want to select the best model. So when you're doing supervised learning, you evaluate errors and you evaluate errors mainly for two reasons. Uh, you want to know uh, how well your model performs in particular on unseen data, because that gives you an impression on how well the model generalizes. Um, but you're also evaluating errors to choose your hyperparameters. For example, you want to choose the optimal parameter for your prior in the maximum posterior case, uh, which we indicated with alpha before, or maybe equivalently, you want to set the right uh, parameter value for lambda uh, in the regularized uh, linear regression case. Okay, so using uh, via these evaluations of errors, we're going to answer mainly two questions. So. First of all, how can we estimate the model performance properly for unknown data? And a second question, how can we choose the optimal hyperparameters? All right, so how are we going to do this uh, when we have a particular data set uh, at hand? Uh, what we're going to do is we're going to split our data into three data sets. And how, how you do this precisely is up to you, but typically you, you randomly assign about 80% of your data to the training set. And this uh, training set uh, will be used to automatically optimize your model, right? This data defines the error, which you will minimize, for example, via stochastic gradient descent. So during training, we're, we are going to minimize this error, um, which my model makes with respect to some target value for each of these data points in the training data. And this will uh, give me a particular optimal value for W. So let, let's write this down. So each training procedure, so we minimize the total error and this gives me an optimal uh, set of parameter values. We, we've seen this before. So these um, W parameters, right? This is, so they, parameter, they parameterize uh, my model. Okay, then we're going to uh, validate these trained models on a separate uh, validation set. So this validation set consists of 10% of of the other data samples. And it's important, of course, that these uh, data samples are not included in the training set, right? So the model hasn't seen these uh, uh, data points before, such that we can make an estimate of the error and get an impression of how well it would generalize. And we're mainly going to use this validation set to tune our hyperparameters, right? Because we could train a model um, for, for every lambda or for every hyperparameter, we could train a model and then we can evaluate how well it performs on this validation set. So we repeat this and we, uh, in the end, we select the most optimal hyperparameter. All right, so the idea is we train a model uh, with a particular hyperparameter that gives me an error estimate and then we do this again for different hyperparameter settings. Just let me write this down. So we repeat. Okay, and, and this part really, really is the, the model selection part. Okay, so you're training a model for all these different hyperparameters and in the end you select a model that performed, performed best on the validation set. So this, uh, this is the model selection phase. Uh, but in the end, you want to also come up with uh, an error estimate or uh, an idea of how well the model actually generalizes to unseen data. Um, so we're going to use a separate, a final separate test set consisting of the remaining 10% of the data. And you, you need an independent test set, right? Because um, now this validation set became part of my entire model selection uh, framework. So I made choices also based on this validation set. So that could mean that I maybe selectively select the hyperparameters that worked best on the validation set, but that doesn't mean it also generalizes well. So really to get a proper impression of how well uh, the model uh, generalizes, you need to work with an independent test set and and that's the general rule. Whenever you report performance measures and you want them to be accurate, um, they should always be done on a test set, uh, which 
wasn't seen by the model uh, during training. And with training, I mean like the entire process of coming up with a, a model and selecting both uh, the parameters W as well as the hyperparameters. So this is important, I'm going to stress it again. So we have a final test error estimate. So uh, this final test error, uh, because the test set can never be part of model selection. Okay, um, it's clear, remember that, never make this mistake. Now, if you only have a very small data set, then your validation and test sets only consist of very few data points. Uh, so this will probably give you a very noisy estimate of the error. Um, I mean, you could be unlucky and sample a couple of outliers, and this will give you the impression that your model is doing a very poor job, whereas, well, you were just unlucky with your uh, test samples, and the validation set was just not representative enough. But also the other way around, you may uh, sample a couple of, let's say, easy points, and this will give you the impression that you have a very good model, uh, but still it doesn't generalize well because it, it has never seen these uh, complicated cases, uh, let's say. Okay, so to, to, in order to increase the validation set size, we're going to use a trick here and it's called cross-validation. And what we're going to do is we're going to, to split our full data into k folds. So the data is split into k folds. And that looks something like this. So we have a full training set. Let's say we split it in five parts. Then um, I'm going to train a model five times. So for each time I select uh, one part for validation. So this will not be part of my training procedure. Um, and then I select the remaining four folds uh, for training. And that would give me one of these models, one out of these five models. Uh, we use this notation that each model uh, index with minus k uh, means that this model was trained on the entire data set without the k fold. So if you do this k times, then every fold becomes part of the validation set once, but in, in, in each training step, um, each validation set isn't used of training. So this, this, in this way, we, every data point is used at least once for validation. So this would give me a better uh, estimate of the error in the end. In the next slide, I'm going to make precise how exactly we're going to uh, do this validation. Um, okay, but this is the general uh, recipe. Uh, and then there's, of course, this number of folds, k to choose. Uh, I mean, I'm, are we going to split it in five parts or 10 or 100? Um, so typically people use the order of five to 10 uh, number of folds. Um, and then of course, there's the option of doing a k K is N, so a leave one out cross validation, really meaning that uh, we are going to use the entire data set for training and only leave one uh, sample out and we're going to validate my model on this one um, data sample. Now let's write down how exactly we're going to do this cross validation. So um, we're going to make use of an indexing function. So this function uh, assigns to each data point the corresponding uh, fold uh, in which it was used for validation. So each uh, index is mapped to one out of these k um, numbers. So each k represents one fold. And then we're going to define uh, the cross validation error as follows. So we're going to take the average of all data points. So the sum i is one to n of my error, evaluate it like this. So what we do here, so we're going to evaluate uh, the error for some data point, and we're going to select the model, uh, which corresponds to uh, the model that didn't use this data point for training. So that's why we use this indexing function. So let me try to make this clear. So for example, uh, on the right, so you have one a full data set, and this particular fold was used for uh, validation, and this was used for training. And then in a second uh, data set, this uh, part of the data was used for validation and the green part for training. So this would give me my model um, y minus one. So my first case one fold uh, was left out and this would give me the model y minus two, where the second fold was left out for training and we're going to use this data uh, for validation. 
Okay, so we're going to use, repeat this k times in this example, uh, k is 5, where the red indicates the part used for validation and the green, uh, the data points used for uh, training. Okay, so in our cross validation, we're going to run over all our uh, data points and each data point uh, is, is here treated as a validation point and we validate it using the model uh, which didn't use this point for training. So at some point we, we have, for example, this data point, xi. So we're going to select the model using this indexing function, ki, and in this case it would be one, right? Because it, uh, it was the first fault where this was used for validation. And maybe at another point we encounter this uh, data point over here, and then my indexing function would select this uh, this particular uh, this particular model uh, to use uh, in the validation step. Okay, so it's clear that with this uh, construction, we're going to use each data point at least once in our validation step, and this would give us a more uh, robust estimate of uh, the prediction error. Um, now we're going to. So this cross-validation can be used for uh, model selection. So that's one task which we're going to use this for model selection, right? So with this, I mean uh, the selection of the optimal hyperparameters, such as, for example, the number of basis functions or um, the regularization uh, factor. But we may also do this to get a, an accurate estimate of the actual model performance. So estimate. Okay, now let's have a closer look at how we would use this in a model selection uh, framework. So our objective would, for example, be to select uh, the best hyperparameter alpha, right? So alpha was a hyperparameter in the maximum a posteriori case. Um, now I can train a model for every possible parameter alpha, and every time it will give me a new cross-validation error. And this cross-validation error was given, again, I'm going to write it down, So basically for each fault, for each training set, so I'm going to repeat this uh, k times, I'm going to train a model uh, y alpha, so using this hyperparameter, and I'm going to validate it using uh, the cross-validation error. And then, in, so I'm going to repeat this for every uh, hyperparameter value, so I'm going to test this for all possible alphas, for example, and I'm going to pick the one that gave overall the best uh, cross-validation error. Okay, so let's say I'm going to test, uh, I'm not going to test for all possible values for alpha, but I'm just going to pick an alpha out of uh, two options. So I'm saying I'm going to train my model two, for two values of alpha, and I'm going to, going to select the best alpha. I'm doing the same for different hyperparameter, let's say beta, and this one will be selected out of three options. Now a beta could be this hyperparameter that models uh, the amount of noise in my data. Then my question to you is, how many times should cross-validation be performed? It is, of course, 2 times 3, right? Because for every combination of alpha and beta, I have to um, do this cross-validation. Um, and this already tells me that if I have a lot of hyperparameters, then I'm going to have to do this a lot of times. And a way around this is to sort of uh, select them separately, uh, so sort of treat to these parameters as being independent, uh, which they are not. Uh, but you could do that, first optimize over alpha, fix that one, and then optimize over beta. That could save you some uh, compute. And now let's, let's think about the total number of runs, really the total number of times I actually have to train a model. What would this be? This would, in this case, be six times the number of faults k. So really this whole cross-validation and model selection uh, procedure uh, tends to be quite uh, computationally heavy and people tend to only do this really when your data set is small. Right? That was the whole reason why we moved to cross-validation because if you have a small data set, my uh, validation and test errors are not really reliable, they're, they're quite noisy. So I want to really maximize the amount of uh, data that I have and go to do this via cross-validation.
But on the other hand, if you already have a very large data set to start with, then maybe it suffices to, to pick one uh, large enough validation set and one large enough test set, and that would give you a reliable estimate animate, uh, anyway, and this would save you a lot of uh, compute. But again, if you do not have a lot of data, then cross-validation is really the best way to, to get an accurate uh, selection of the hyperparameters, but also an accurate um, impression of the actual um, performance. Okay, so that was uh, with respect to hyperparameter tuning, but in the end you still have to test it, right? So we, we trained our model and we selected our hyperparameters via cross-validations using this particular, particular data set, but then still, if you test it, the test set shouldn't be part of the, your entire pr training procedure. It should be completely independent of what you did before. So you always have to work with this uh, separate test set. Again, <laughs> stress this, evaluate your, your model always on a held out uh, test set. Uh, but again, now the problem is that this test set could be still be quite small. So that would give you a very noisy estimate of your, um, of your error. So also now, maybe we also want to do some sort of cross-validation uh, to get a better uh, estimate of the generalization error. So what we could do now is do nested cross-validation. And this looks like this. Now remember that your reported performance measures uh, can never be evaluated on data which was part from, of your training procedure. So that means actual model optimization as well as the hyperparameter selection. So what we're going to do, we split our data into these folds. So where one part is used for training and hyperparameter tuning and one part is used for testing. So in this case, this part is used to select an optimal value for alpha and an optimal value for beta. And I'm going to index it with a one because this was done on, um, well, the first uh, fold in my nested uh, cross-validation. And then this part is used for testing. So this gives me uh, well, uh, already one estimate of the generalization uh, error. Now, of course, then I can repeat this for the next fold. So that would give me a new set of hyperparameters of uh, 2 and beta 2. And I'm going to test this on this um, held out uh, test fold. Okay, so now I did this for uh, my second fold. And uh, I continue to do so. And in the end, this means that every data point is at least once used for, uh, for, well, for validating the, the generalization error using this test set. So this gives me then in the end uh, a more accurate estimation of the, the generalization error. Okay, so the whole point of this whole nested cross-validation was to get a reliable estimate of the generalization performance. Uh, so now if you build a machine learning framework for a customer, for example, um, these test errors that you now computed are quite representative and you say, okay, this is how my model is going to perform. And maybe I add some uncertainty there by looking at the variations uh, among all these uh, test sets. But of course, I also want to deliver the best possible product. So maybe I could still retrain the model that I'm going to deliver using all the data that I have making a particular choice on the hyperparameters based on the analysis that we just did. Uh, but still, as far as reporting generalization performance goes, the nested cross-validation error is the most accurate thing I can say about it. So far, we saw that in the Bayesian setting, we could obtain predictive distributions which were no longer dependent on the model parameters W. The predictions in the end are entirely based on the data or let's say entirely based on the experience gained so far. In this video, we'll have a closer look at what this actually means and see that it gives us a new viewpoint on modeling, namely through kernels. So this is what we saw in the previous uh, video that in this Bayesian regression setting, my, in the end I have predictive distributions which no longer depend on W because they were marginalized out via this Bayesian model averaging. Uh, and that's indicated over here, right? So we have a predictive distribution for each uh, W and we take a weighted average or this integral and we weight each uh, distribution with uh, the posterior for W. So the probability that that particular W uh, defined a good model. And that in the end gives us a predictive distribution which no longer depends on W. Now these predictive distributions, so they, they predict for each given uh, input x prime, the probabilities for the, the corresponding target uh, t prime taking on some values. 
and this uh, probability distribution was parameterized via a Gaussian, right? So uh, with a particular mean given as follows and a particular standard uh, deviation or variance. So the mean for this predictive distribution around x uh, prime is given by uh, this product of uh, a mean vector mn and uh, the, the basis vector, so the, the feature vector uh, evaluated at x prime. And this mean vector mn really describes a particular set of, of model weights which were obtained via the maximum posterior solution for w. So this mn is an element of rm, it's an m-dimensional vector. So this mn really is like my Bayesian averaged model parameters. And then to in order to turn this, uh, uh, this into a mean prediction uh, for every point x prime, I just uh, take the product with the basis function. So this really is expanding the basis using these uh, weights. And that gives me a prediction for the mean for my uh, target distribution at point x prime. Okay, and now the main point here is that this predictive distribution it depends on my basis functions and the x prime, but nowhere do we see uh, the w's anymore. Uh, so my predictive distribution at x prime is completely determined by my uh, data points, really. And what I'm going to do next is I'm going to make this a bit more explicit by really writing out uh, what this predictive mean looks like. So I'm going to call this mean, this predictive mean, I'm going to call it y x prime mn. So it's a linear model. Uh, which maps uh, an x prime to uh, a particular mean and it is parameterized by uh, mn. Okay, so I'm writing out this term which is the predictive mean. Okay, so really let's just fill in this expression over here and write it out and I'm going to write it out in such a way that it becomes very clear how my predictions uh, are obtained via a linear combination of my data points. Okay, so let's just start writing this out. So I have beta phi x prime transpose covariance matrix and times the design matrix transpose times t. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to expand this particular term here. Uh, so really this is matrix vector multiplication. So I do rho times vector, rho times vector. So I'm going to make this a sum. I'm going to explicitly write it out. So that gives me, well, the first part is the same. So beta phi x prime transpose sn and then the sum and the sum looks like this right so i'm looping or summing over my uh, n so over my n data points and every time i take the product of tn so of tn together with this particular vector of uh, well feature values so the basis function is evaluated at that point so that's what we see over here right so we're going to this thing will be uh, this blue vector indicated over there for each n. Okay, so this sum eventually gives me a vector um, in of size uh, of length m, which will form like the new vector for this next matrix vector multiplication with the uh, sn. Now I'm going to move uh, the sum up front. So sum over n is one to n beta phi x prime transpose. Sn. And, and then I know that these factors, that's really the same uh, basis factor, right? So I can write it out as follows. So that would place here this feature vector for each end data point um, yeah, times Tn. So and finally, I'm going to give a name to this particular thing. I'm going to call this the kernel and define it as follows. So really, I'm taking the sum n is 1 to n of my kernel, x, which is a function of x prime and x and n, tn. So that's uh, this thing over here. Uh, I'm just going to write that here. So this kernel is really defined as beta phi x prime transpose sn phi xn. So really this is something that we define. We say the kernel is defined in such a way so really what we did was uh, we rewrote the expression for the predictive mean to make very explicit how my predictions are formed via a linear combination of my existing data points. Uh, so this was done via an equivalent kernel. So for each uh, basis functions, I can define a particular equivalent kernel that describes, yeah, <laughs> again, how my predictions are formed as a linear combination of my data points. 
So for a given x prime, um, I can fill in this x prime in this kernel and then retrieve the weights that I'm going to assign to each target in my data by evaluating uh, the corresponding x ends. Okay, so let's have a closer look at what this uh, kernel uh, looks like. So this is the expression for the kernel that we obtained. And with this kernel, we can obtain predictions uh, for the means for my target values. And what we actually see nicely here is that um, the kernel values uh, are large whenever x prime and x are close to each other. So let me write this out. So on this axis, we have x. And on this axis, we have x prime, right? We have a 2D kernel of two input arguments, an x and an x prime. So the diagonal corresponds to points that are close to each other, right? And red in this plot means high values. So the kernel takes on high values whenever x and x prime are close to each other. And whenever they're distant uh, from one another, it takes on uh, smaller values. So this means if I want to make a prediction for around a particular x prime, so I take a look at this x prime over here, then these are the corresponding weights that I assign to the targets um, in my data set. So the targets in my data sets are here indicated with x. So whenever um, x, so a particular xn is close to x prime, so that's a point over here, I assign large weights. And when I move away from this point, I uh, assign low weights. So this is a really interesting observation, right? So it tells us that uh, predictions uh, around a particular x prime are dominated uh, by my training data points, which are really close to uh, x prime. So in that sense, you could say that the kernel quantifies the amount of similarity or let's say affinity between two uh, data points. Now, this particular example was taken from the book of Bishop, where uh, they considered some regression problem, uh, in this case using Gaussian basis functions. And I want to stress here that we see this sort of locality property of these kernels, that similar or close by points contribute more to the predictions than far away points. So really uh, the weights are sort of localized. This behavior, we see that in all sorts of uh, basis functions. So not just for Gaussian basis functions, but also for polynomials, which are highly non-localized, right? So this locality property is something that we see over a wide range of, of basis functions. And it actually follows from the continuity of these basis functions. Okay, so we see that training points close to x prime contribute more to the prediction uh, at that particular point. Okay, so that's one viewpoint on these kernels, but we could also approach it slightly different by looking at really at the, the covariance between two uh, predictions. So uh, what I'm considering now is um, I'll make two predictions. So one around x1 and one around x2. So this, uh, my model gives me a predictive distribution for, for each of these uh, x1 and x prime. And I'm going to look at the covariance between these predictions. Okay, now it turns out that this covariance uh, is given by the covariance between my models over my model parameters w, right? Uh, so we saw that actually that uncertainty in my prediction uh, actually comes from uncertainty in my model parameters in the end. Uh, we saw that with these uh, plus one, minus one uh, standard deviation intervals or also by explicitly showing that uh, given my data, I could fit multiple uh, functions to it, right? With multiple w's. And now if we take the covariance of these models um, so around these two data points uh, with respect to W, um, we can write it out and show that this actually leads to uh, uh, the kernel itself. Okay, so let's just write out the definition of uh, the covariance between these two uh, model predictions. And of course, it doesn't really matter if I put the W on the left or right hand side. This is just a scalar product. Um, I'm putting here the W on the left hand side because I need that in my derivation. Um, so the covariance is really given by the expectation over W of the product of my models. So x1 transpose W, W transpose phi x2 minus um, the product of the two expectations. So the expectation over W Okay, now I can make use of the linearity of these expectations. So the expectation is taken over W. So these terms, so these uh, phi uh, vectors, they do not depend uh, on W. So I can move them outside. I'm going to move this to the left and this to the right. Also here, this to the left and this to the right. 
So I can see, uh, I can write this as follows. Right, I moved the, the phi's outside to the left and to the right. And so this expectation is, uh, these expectations are sort of sandwiched in, in between. And well, we recognize this as the expression for the covariance for W itself. So actually I'm computing here um, phi x1 transpose with the covariance matrix of W with itself and then phi x2 on the right hand side. Okay, and we know what the covariance of W is because uh, we say that the W is drawn from this posterior distribution, which is a, a Gaussian distribution, which has a particular mean and a particular covariance. So uh, the covariance of W is really directly given by this uh, covariance matrix Sn. So this entire thing is given by phi x1 transpose Sn phi x2. And now again we recognize the form for uh, the kernel which is given over here. So really the covariance between two predictions is given by 1 over beta the kernel x1 x2. Okay let me mark that down. So the covariance between two predictions uh, is given by uh, this kernel, is quantified by this kernel uh, k. Okay, great. So we see that for our Bayesian regression with basis functions, we can derive a so-called equivalent kernel, which quite explicitly describes how my predictions are formed by a linear combination of my data. And it takes on the interpretation as the amount of covariance uh, between predictions for different data points. Um, well, we also saw that the kernel tends to be localized and uh, meaning that data points that are close by contribute more to the predictions than uh, data points that are far away. And this is actually a really nice result, which we're happy to see, right? Because uh, this was sort of to be expected from the intuition that points close by would, well, uh, would have similar uh, predictive values. Um, okay, so we just saw that in the case of Bayesian regression with basis functions, we could derive a viewpoint based on equivalent kernels. And for now we leave it as it is, but later on in this course we will return to this kernel-based viewpoint and directly work with formulations based on kernels without defining upfront what the corresponding basis functions are. And as we will see, this will eventually lead to a very generic approach to regression. In the previous video I explained the idea behind probabilistic generative models, where we want to obtain a full probabilistic parameterization for the data as then we can rely on decision theory to make optimal decisions. And again, Gaussian distributions prove to be useful in this setting, as then when the covariance matrices are shared, we obtain linear decision boundaries, and this results in a linear discriminant analysis framework. So what we did, we defined how we can parameterize our distributions, and now in this video, we are actually going to find the optimal set of parameters via the maximum likelihood principle. Now the setting is that we have this data set of inputs with corresponding binary targets. So in this video, we're going to consider the k is two case uh, for now. Um, this means, so let me draw that. So we have a bunch of data samples of these x's and some of those x's came from, uh, well, a target one from class one. So I'm going to indicate it with blue. And some of these data points came from, um, well, the, 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 the second class. So the red points belong to class two, uh, let's say T is one, and the blue points belong to T is zero, so the first class. Okay, so we have data points, so these X's and the corresponding targets, which I color coded uh, over here. Now our objective is to recover uh, the Gaussian distributions or to recover the actual distributions that generated this data. We want to recover the joint distribution and we're going to do that via Gaussian conditional densities in combination with priors because then the joint probabilities were obtained via the product of these uh, conditionals with the priors. Then we decided to model these uh, Gaussian conditional densities via a uh, multivariate Gaussian distribution. So each of these Gaussians, so we want to uh, recover a distribution for this uh, class, which has a particular mu1 and can have a particular covariance matrix, um, sigma1. 
The same for the second distribution. So also for this one, what we want to recover the parameters for the Gaussian, which have some mean mu2 and it has some covariance matrix um, sigma2. Now we already saw that uh, when we model these conditionals with different uh, covariance matrices, we end up with quadratic decision boundaries. Um, so that leads to quadratic discriminant analysis. Uh, but uh, we want to keep it for now simple. Uh, so we choose to share the covariance matrices and that leads to linear discriminant analysis. So let me just quickly make this drawing again. So what we're now going to do, we're going to assume that each conditional, like both conditionals share the same covariance matrix, but each distribution has its own uh, mean parameter mu1 and mu2. And if we do it this way, then it turns out that in the end, we obtain a linear decision boundary. And so we call this framework a linear discriminant analysis. Okay, so in this setting, both have the same covariance matrix, uh, capital sigma. And I drew this uh, covariance matrix uh, as, as, a, as if it was an isotropic uh, uh, covariance matrix. In the general case, this isn't the case, but in this particular example, I will show via the upcoming derivations that in the end, um, these covariance matrices uh, will turn out to be isotropic, even though these separate covariance matrices are uh, anisotropic. Okay, but that's our objective. Uh, so this is how we're going to model the data with two of such uh, Gaussian uh, conditional distributions. And we're set out to find the proper parameters, uh, mu1, mu2, and the covariance matrix. Uh, but we also need to re recover the priors. And we're going to model the priors with just a number because we have two classes. So that means this number represents the probability for, uh, like the overall probability of observing a data point from class one will be represented with Q. And then for the other class, this will be one minus Q. Okay, and then we have a full probabilistic description of my data, namely the joint probability uh, for an XN for class one will be given by Q. So the prior times, well, my uh, Gaussian distribution parameterized with the mu one and a covariance matrix. And for the other class, it will be one minus Q times the normal distribution XN with its own mean, but the same covariance matrix. Okay, so we're uh, going to pick our parameters. So we have these parameters Q, mu uh, one and two and sigma, and we're going to choose this based on the max maximum likelihood principle. Now recall that the likelihood uh, is given by uh, basically the joint likelihood of all my data points, uh, which we assume to be uh, IID. So they all come from the same distribution, which we're going to model uh, with this product of, um, well, the conditional and the prior. Okay, so the likelihood is then obtained by filling in these, uh, these data points, the XN and the TNs in our prior and the conditionals evaluating this and taking the product over all my data points, right? Because that gives me the joint likelihood for these data samples being observed given my uh, distribution. And I said we're modeling the distribution with these Gaussians and the priors, which were just given by numbers. Okay, and then we param parameterized the joint in such a way that for whenever T uh, equals one, so for one particular class, for class one, um, this is what I'm evaluating. This is what the, the joint distribution looked like. And for the other class for T is zero, this is what it looks like. And now I'm going to make use of the fact that I'm working with a binary classification uh, method such that my labels, I'm going to code it with one or zero. And this allows me to apply this sort of selection mechanism here, right? So for whenever class T is one, this thing will be one, I'm going to select indeed the joint probability for class one and my XN. And whenever um, TN is zero, then this thing, well, something to the power of zero will evaluate to one. So this thing uh, is ignored, but this thing will be active because then we have one minus zero. So it means for T is zero, we select uh, the probabilities for class two. Okay, so that then gives us this uh, nice expression for the likelihood, which is formulated as the product of all these 
uh, distributions where I select the appropriate distribution for the corresponding class by taking these powers. And this was then the joint for class one. So the prior for class one is Q times uh, the class conditional distribution. And then the same for the second uh, uh, class, namely the prior one minus Q times the corresponding class conditional. Okay, and we've done this many times before, right? In the regression case, and the same principles also now apply in this probabilistic setting for classification. So instead of optimizing the likelihood, we're going to make it a bit more convenient for ourselves and we're going to work with the log likelihood. And well, the log of the likelihood, so we have this product of all these individual uh, data point likelihoods that becomes a sum over all my data points. And then we have a product of these two terms. So this product also sims, uh, splits in a separate sum. So that's what we see over here. And then if we focus on, on one of these distributions, so t to the power n, if I take the log of something to the power tn, I can take this power up front. That's what's happening here. And uh, so if this q, this factor, so this is again a product, so it splits well in these two terms. So this represents the log of uh, my first uh, joint uh, uh, probability. Okay, so the log of this thing gives me this over here and the log of this thing gives me this part over here. Okay, so now we're going to maximize the log likelihood um, by the principles that we're used to. So we computed the derivative with respect to the parameter uh, that we consider and set this to zero and then solve it. And we start, start off by estimating uh, Q, so uh, the prior uh, probability. Okay, so we're trying to find an estimate for Q and let's mark the terms where I observe this Q that's here and that's here. So that's what I'm going to focus on now. And I'm going to deriv take the derivative with respect to Q. So we still have the sum over all data points and it's one to N. Uh, the derivative of this thing, the derivative of the log is one over Q. So that gives me dn over q plus uh, similarly here we can compute the derivative 1 minus dn 1 over 1 minus q times minus 1 actually right because I'm computing the chain rule so that's 1 over the thing inside and then the derivative what's inside the log with respect to q that's minus 1 so uh, that shows up over here okay let's combine this so that's the sum n is 1 to n tn 1 minus q minus 1 minus tn times q divided by q 1 minus q okay okay so let's quickly expand the numerator and simplify it a bit okay where we see that this product of tn with q cancels out so we can write this entire derivative of the log likelihood uh, the derivative with respect to q as n is 1 to n, tn minus q, q1 minus q. And this is what we're going to set to 0, and now we're going to solve it for q. Okay, so this means actually that we're solving n is 1 to n, q is, and then the sum n is 1 to n of tn. And we could do this uh, because I'm assuming that Q is unequal to zero. And I'm also assuming that Q is unequal to one because then I can ignore this term and really focus on this. And this makes sense, right? We're looking for the prior probability. And uh, so we're, we're, we're actually going to assume some number between zero and one. Um, okay, so that gives me this expression over here. Q doesn't depend on N. So this thing actually is going to evaluate to N times Q and that will give us the final estimate, the maximum likelihood estimate for Q, which is given by the Q maximum likelihood is given by one over N and then the sum for N is one to N of TN. And TN is a binary thing that is either zero or one. So really what I'm doing is I'm counting the number of times TN is one. Uh, so this actually gives me the ratio n1 over n. So like the total number of times that I'm observing a class one um, in the context of my total number of uh, observations. 
Okay, great. So we have obtained the maximum likelihood solution for Q and it really is the fraction of times that I'm observing um, class one. And that's also what it represents, right? So Q represents the prior probability of observing class one. Okay, now we can follow the same recipe for the other parameters. Uh, let's focus now on mu1. Uh, where do we see mu1? That's this term. So we're going to focus on computing the derivative of this term. Meaning I have to compute the derivative of Tm times the log of my Gaussian, di Gaussian distribution. Now the Gaussian distribution consists of this uh, front factor plus this exponential. The front factor doesn't depend on mu, so we're going to ignore that for now. And then we take the log of this exponential. And that's just the thing, what was inside the exponent, right? So we're going to compute the derivative of this quadratic form with respect to mu. And actually we've done that before in one of the exercises and I put a note about this on, on canvas, but it's not too hard to show then that this, that this derivative evaluates to dn times xn minus mu one transpose sigma inverse. And this is what we're going to set to zero. And actually I can write it in this form because um, sigma is symmetric. Okay, please refer to the notes on canvas if you don't believe me uh, on this. So, okay, so this is derivative and we set it to zero and recall that in our convention, the derivative of our multivariate variable is going to be a row vector. So actually this has to be at the zero row vector. Okay, now this implies actually that we're solving for um, the sum n is one to n of tn mu one equals the sum n is one to n tn times xn. Where this step really comes from the fact that this uh, sigma term doesn't determine, uh, well, the solution. Uh, this thing is actually positive definite, so it will never be this term that causes this to be zero. Okay, so here this step was based on the fact that sigma is positive definite. And then what I did, I moved uh, the xn terms to the right and kept mu1 on, on the left hand side. And that gives me uh, this over here. And this in turn implies um, because what I'm doing here is a sum over n, where tn is either zero or one, mu one doesn't depend um, on n. So this actually gives me n one. So the number of times tn was equal to one times mu one equals uh, this sum over here, tn xn, and we can move the n one to the other side. Okay, so this really tells me that the maximum likelihood solution for mean one is given by one over n1 sum n is one to n uh, tn xn. And this is really the sample mean, this is really the sample mean of all my points within this class for which tn equals one, right? Because I'm ignoring all the points for which tn is zero because then this product is zero. Okay, so this is really the mean over my points in class one. And I have the same for uh, mu2, same derivation, I see that this is going to be the sample mean n is one of all points in the class two, right? Where this term is one whenever tn is zero and all the other terms are ignored. So this, uh, the mean for um, my second class is given by uh, the sample mean over the points in that class. Okay, great. So we now also have the maximum likelihood solution for the means. Uh, let's go back to the first slide. So that means now we already have obtained mu1 and mu2. So really the sample means over the points in class one gives me mu1 and the same, the mean over the points in class two gives me mu2. Now, finally, we can do the same for the covariance matrix. And once we've done that, we have a complete description of our data uh, given our, our Gaussian model. So the recipe is the same. We take the derivative with respect to the covariance matrix. So now it actually becomes a bit more complicated because now I'm taking this uh, tensor derivative or this matrix derivative of the log of the likelihood, which means I have to take the derivative uh, of these terms and these terms, which in the end means that I have to take the derivative of this 
over here. And now I'm not going to write this out because it takes a bit too long and it's a bit distracting from uh, the point that I'm trying to make. Uh, so I keep it short here. Um, there is some short derivation in the book of bishops. So let me write that down in bishop 4.2.2. Um, but I also included a note on canvas uh, in which one of the previous uh, teachers, uh, Rianne van der Berg, uh, wrote out how to compute this uh, matrix derivative. So if you're interested in this, um, please look at, take a look at uh, the book and her notes. Um, but the main point I'm trying to make here is that if we do this and we set it to zero and then solve for the covariance matrix, we get the expression that we see over here, that we see here below. And this is a really nice result, actually. We see that uh, the, the maximum likelihood solution for the covariance matrix uh, consists of the sample covariance of the points within class 1. So this is going to be a sigma 1. Partly consists of the covariance matrix of class 2. Right? This is the covariance matrix uh, when we're dealing with a discrete data set. And my final maximum likelihood uh, covariance will be a weighted average of these two covariance matrices, where uh, the first one is weighted with the number of times uh, my, uh, I observe my data points in this class, plus my weight, so the number of times um, my data point lies in, in the second class. So my maximum likelihood solution will be a combination of these two covariance matrices. So if we then go back to the first slide, so we were estimating these uh, uh, distributions with Gaussians and we said we're going to share the covariance matrix uh, so they will be the same. Uh, it turns out that this sigma will be a weighted average of these two covariance matrices. And what I did in this example, I plotted these points, so I sort of assumed that these points had this uh, covariance matrix, anisotropic in one direction, and this one is anisotropic in the other direction, and the average of the two uh, will cancel out these anisotropies and will lead to a uh, well, isotropic covariance uh, matrix. Okay, um, so I, I want to stress now that um, I took this as an example, but in the general case, um, the resulting covariance matrix, matrix does not have to be isotropic, right? If this distribution was isotropic also and isotropic also in this direction, just like this one, then well, the average of the two will also be uh, anisotropic in this direction. Uh, but the main point is that these sigmas are the same and that will re result in a linear decision boundary. Okay, so really that wraps it up for this uh, maximum likelihood approach for determining these modeling parameters. Um, so the, the idea was we had these data points coming from class one, let's say to distribute it like this and we have a point of class two. Let me now draw it also maybe with a covariance matrix, uh, which is anisotropic. Okay, then um, the mean of the Gaussian distribution for this uh, class will be given by the sample mean for the points in that class. Uh, the mean for this will be given by the sample mean, well, of that class. So those were the maximum likelihood solution solutions given over here. Okay, and then we also want to uh, estimate this covariance matrix, and it turns out that this covariance matrix will be a um, weighted sum of this covariance matrix. So let's call it a uh, covariance matrix for class one, a weighted sum with the covariance matrix for class two. And now I drew them actually to be mostly similar. So that means that in the end, my weighted average of this covariance matrix will also look a lot like this. Okay, so the covariance matrix, uh, the maximum likelihood solution for the covariance matrix was the weighted average of these two separate covariance uh, matrices. And now that, that tells me then that in the end, because I have two Gaussians with the same covariance matrix, that my decision boundary will be linear. And then finally, for this full probabilistic setting, we also had to compute uh, the prior probabilities. And these are simply computed via the fraction of or the number of times that I observe data points in one class. Okay, and then all of this together gives me a nice description for the joint probabilities, uh, which evaluate for, for class one is given as follows, and evaluate for class two is given as follows. 
Okay, and then a really final remark, this whole framework was called linear discriminant analysis because the final result of my model uh, will lead to a linear decision boundary. And I showed before uh, that it comes from the fact that now uh, my posterior distributions uh, for the classes are given in the following form. So this is still the, the binary case. So we had this linear model which we then pull to a logistic sigmoid. And this linear model can now also be expressed in uh, the identities or the, the entities that we just derived, namely uh, the maximum likelihood solution for this linear model would then be given by the covariance inverse times the difference between the two uh, model averages. And then we have also uh, this bias term expressed in the same components that we just computed. So we really have a full solution to our um, model and now we can make predictions with this. So whenever we have a new data point X prime, we're just going to ev evaluate the posterior distribution. And whenever it's larger than a half, then we say it belongs to class one. And if it's lower than a half, then we say it belongs to class two. Okay, now uh, purely thinking in this linear model over here, this classification boundary is saying that it's larger than a half actually corresponds to checking whenever my linear model for this given X prime. So I just evaluate this linear model is bigger than zero. So that's the only thing I need to check if I want to decide whether this point lies in class one or in class two. Okay, so there's some clear advantages to this linear uh, discriminant analysis framework. Uh, first and foremost, uh, the model parameters can be derived analytically in closed form. So that's summarized over here. And once we have that, we have a full parametric probabilistic description of my data and we can use it to make decisions and the decisions rules are very simple by this linear model. Now there are also some disadvantages to linear discriminant analysis and I think the most important one is that the Gaussian distributions are very uh, sensitive to outliers meaning that if I have a data point in the red class somewhere over here then that really induces a great shift in the mean in this direction. And actually the same in the covariance matrix, it will become uh, distorted. So this Gaussian framework is actually quite sensitive to outliers. Uh, another thing is, and I'll get back to that uh, later on, but it heavily relies on handcrafted features. So if I go to higher dimensional spaces, I want to work with basis functions and um, I have to make choices there. And that complicates uh, things a bit. And, and finally, a remark, which we also actually saw in the linear regression case, the same here in the linear classification case, is that the maximum likelihood solutions are quite prone to overfitting, right? Because in this uh, maximum likelihood approach, I so far I didn't consider any regularization terms. So far, all the models for both regression and classification were equally applicable to data that was first transformed via basis functions. Now in this short video, I'm going to briefly remind you of the usefulness of basis functions uh, now in the classification setting, but I'm also going to talk a little bit about their limitations. And this will eventually motivate us to make learning of basis functions part of our modeling approach. And this will eventually lead to the formulation of multi-layer perceptrons or neural networks. But first things first, let's take a look at a toy example where basis functions are clearly beneficial. Now suppose we are given this two dimensional data set. So we have uh, features, uh, like two features can be anything and I have two classes and I want to separate these two classes. So one indicated in red and the other in blue via a, a linear classification model or maybe generalized linear classification model. Then there's no way I'm going to be able to separate uh, these two classes with just a linear um, a classifier, right? So I could draw a, a decision boundary somewhere over here um, that will classify this correctly, this correctly, but then this part won't uh, be classified correctly. And I can try out all sorts of uh, decision boundaries, but none of them uh, would work. Now, this is a, a nice example of where we can use basis functions to turn this into a linear classification problem. So we can design, uh, we can pick basis functions such that uh, the data transforms in the following way, that uh, the, the blue data points can be clearly separated with the linear decision boundary from the red uh, data points. Now in this particular example, we're going to do that via Gaussian basis, basis functions, uh, where we uh, center a Gaussian function around this point over here and this point over here. Um, so let's say 
this Gaussian has an average or a mean value mu1 and uh, this particular one has a mean value mu2. So what does that look like? So my first feature value is going to be obtained by mapping this point x to this first basis function. And this first basis function was a, a, a Gaussian basis function. So that means an exponential to the power of minus a half x minus mu one. So the distance to the first center x minus mu two. And then I have this uh, second basis function phi two of x, which essentially uh, computes the affinity or closeness of a data point x to the second mean. Okay, so that's the second basis function. It's also a Gaussian basis function. And that's how we could interpret this, right? So this uh, basis function, essentially, uh, what's happened in, inside this exponential is I'm going to compute the distance from a point x to this mu, and I'm going to pull this through this exponential. So whenever this distance is small, this exponential will have a large value. Uh, and whenever this distance is large, for example, uh, points over here have a large distance to this uh, mean, uh, then e to the power of minus something large will lead to a, a small value. Okay, so this first basis function computes the first component of my new feature vector, right? And the second basis function computes uh, the second component of my new uh, feature vector. So each data uh, point um, now gets a new location in this new feature uh, space. Okay, so let's see how this works. So we have this cluster of points. All these points, they are close to this first Gaussian uh, mean. They are close to mu1. So that means that they will have a large value um, for obtained from uh, the first basis function. So they will have a large uh, phi1 component. Uh, so large means close to one because the distance is close to zero. This exponential is close to one. So it will correspond to this, this particular set of points. Now, if I focus on uh, the red cluster, so all these points, they are very close to mu2. So they will have a large uh, feature vector phi2 or large feature value phi2. So this actually corresponds to this set of points, right? So because phi2 is very close to one, it's because all these points are uh, close uh, to mu2. And then finally, we have this set of points. These set of points, they are very far away from mu1, so they will have a value close to zero. And the distance is large, so e to the power or minus something large will bring it to zero. So we indeed see that the phi1 components of this cluster uh, takes on uh, small values. And if you compare it to the mu2 cluster, obviously these points are further away than the red point, so they will have a lower value in phi2, and they're about the same distance away. So this cluster is about the same distance away to this average as this cluster is, so they have about the same uh, value for the, the feature value uh, phi2. Okay, so each data point, each point x, gets mapped to a new uh, point phi of x. This is the vector obtained by stacking these basis uh, function values, and these were the points x. Okay, so now this is what we've been doing all along when we talked about uh, working with basis functions. We have an input vector x, and we can transform it to a new vector space via these basis functions. And now we are going to perform classification in this new, um, well, a new vector space. And because of our clever choice of basis functions, in this particular case, they were Gaussians, we were able to uh, nicely separate the groups. And now this actually enables us to work with a linear classifier, with a linear decision boundary, simply by focusing on, well, primarily, essentially, this is feature value phi2. So, this essentially tells us that um, all points for which the phi2 feature value is large, those belong to the red class. So in a way, maybe I could also um, build a classifier just based on this feature vector. Uh, but in the general case, well, um, you want to use different uh, basis functions to come up with a nice decomposition of your input data. Okay, so this is a very clear advantage of basis functions, right? So with a proper choice of basis functions, we can turn this highly nonlinear classification problem in uh, essentially a linear classification problem via these uh, basis function transformations. But this already also exposes a limitation of basis functions because 
now I know what the data looks like. I work with 2D data, I can visualize this, I can get an impression of how my data is distributed, and I can come up with clever choices for my basis functions. But what if you go to high dimensional uh, data sets, then it becomes very messy to make these kind of uh, visualiz visualizations and come up with, with proper, with decent choices uh, for the basis functions. Right, so um, let's just quickly go over some advantages and disadvantages of working with basis functions. Maybe first and foremost, uh, these uh, basis functions allow for, for building non-linear mo models or non-linear mappings from input variables to target variables through basis functions. And that's what we're doing here, right? My classify in itself is linear, but I first uh, pull my uh, input vectors x through some non-linear function mapping um, and Okay, so essentially the whole pipeline is non-linear in that sense with respect to X. So that allows me to build very complex uh, functions in the end. And once we've defined our basis functions and uh, the methods that we're used to work with in, uh, on the input space X, uh, they equally apply well to these new feature values. And that leads actually to the fact that we can obtain closed form solutions for least squared problems and that we still have that, uh, can work with a tractable uh, Bayesian treatment where this tractable Treatment basically means that we work with, with linear uh, function mappings and such. And uh, so once, we ha once we've been through this non-linear mapping, then everything else uh, can be kept simple, essentially. Now, some possible limitation of this is that uh, these basis functions, they are fixed, right? They're not learned. So I have to decide, decide on them, I have to choose them. And once I make my decision, uh, I keep them as they is. But ideally, maybe you also want to incorporate this as part of your modeling framework to also optimally select or actually learn these basis functions. Now that is an issue which we're going to solve in one of the upcoming videos when we talk about neural networks or multi-layer perceptrons. Then we consider um, the modeling of these functions uh, as part of the, the learning process itself. And another limitation is actually uh, this curse of dimensionality, right? So if my dimensionality grows, well, first of all, it makes it very complicated uh, for us to come up with choices for the basis functions. Uh, but also, we want our basis functions to cover my entire space, right? Um, because we want every input point X to be mapped to some meaningful uh, new feature value. Uh, so that means, especially if you go to higher dimensionals, uh, higher dimensions, uh, we have a higher and larger and larger space to cover with basis functions. So that leads to a very rapid grow of uh, the number of basis functions. Okay, that basically covers uh, what we call the curse of dimensionality, which is also discussed in chapter one of the book of Bishop. Now, what we're going to do in the later videos, we're going to focus on this limitation that the basis functions are fixed. And we're going to actually learn this via multi-layer perceptrons. But before we get there, we will continue uh, going over uh, the three methods for uh, classification. So discriminative methods, uh, probabilistic generative modeling, and well, next up is uh, probabilistic discriminative modeling using uh, logistic regression.